is a special presentation of ESPN on ABC. so simple just tracking tires fuel and fire every man for himself two friends pushing themselves to the limit of endurance and patience if he's gonna want me like that he's giving me no choice but the past is the past because at these speeds, there is no time but the present. What will it be? A late season streak for a repeat? Dude, you are incredible. Awesome job today. Good job. Or a run from behind into history. The one thing that is certain is that we never know what's up ahead. That's the first and most basic rule of the world. That's why we watch the chase for the next Hill Cup. You are looking live at Homestead Miami Speedway. Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon, the only two drivers to have survived the grueling chase for the next Hill Cup. One of them will hoist the trophy tonight as Ford Championship Weekend culminates with the Ford 400. 14,000 miles, folks, and we've come down to the final 400. Each driver started the year at Daytona, hoping to hoist that next hill trophy, and now we have come down to the final two. 86 points separates teammates and good friends, Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon. But let's be honest, it is Jimmy Johnson's next hill cup to lose. In fact, the end of this season has been one of the greatest ever. He has won four consecutive NASCAR races in the thick of the chase, and he's going for number five. Folks, he's starting to walk with the legends, but this is racing. Anything can happen. Let's take you back to last season now. Johnson came here with a 63-point lead. It took just 16 laps for trouble to hit. Red tape covered a hole in Johnson's grill after he ran over some debris. Later, lug nut issues in the pits sent him toward the back of the field, but in the end, Johnson earned his title, but not without drama. We could have more here today, and Susie Culver, anything can happen. Tell us about the wild turn of events we've already witnessed here this weekend. It was Friday night, and it sure looked like Mike Skinner was the favorite to win the Craftsman Truck Series title. He came in with a 29-point lead and was in a familiar spot, leading when on lap 74, his left rear wheel flew off, temporarily knocking him out of the race and opening the door for Ron Hornaday. Hornaday won his first truck title since 1998. Skinner finished 35th out of 36 spots. That's an 83-point swing, and that's why we say it's not over till it's over. Well, welcome into the pit studio. Susie Culver, Rusty Wallace, Brad Daugherty. Now, Jimmy Johnson has been talking all week about trying to keep that nervousness at bay. So here he is on Friday. He wins the poll. Check that one off. On Saturday, fastest in happy hour, so check that one off. But Rusty, 1989, you came into the last race with a 73-point lead. What was that like? Uh, it was the most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. I really was. I had a great qualifying run. I started fourth. The late Dale Sr. started third. I'm racing him for the title. A car is flying. All of a sudden, the lug nuts come loose. I hit pit road, lose two laps. I go back in the racetrack, the lug nuts come loose again. I lose another lap. All of a sudden, I see the thing flying away. I ask my team, what have I got to do to get this thing back? He said, you're 21st, you need to finish 16th. I'm picking another one up, I'm picking another one up, I'm picking another one up. They holler at the radio and say, you got it. But you know what? We only got it by 12 points. Yeah, you're celebrating there, but white knuckles. <laughs> oh, man, was I nervous. It was unbelievable. I can only imagine what Jimmy Johnson's going through right now. Now. Well, Brad, you've spent time around Jimmy sure. this weekend, so what are your impressions of how he's handling the pressure? Well, it's been very impressive from the standpoint he's been very honest about his emotions, emotions, the nervousness and everything leading up to this week. He's tried to put it on the back burner. He's tried to distract himself, but he says, hey, every time that I think that I have something captured, whether it's been throughout my 
motorcycle career, whatever, it always come back to bite me. So I'm preparing just like I'm going out to win this race. I'm going to drive as hard as I possibly can, but I'm going to drive within the limits of the race car. I will not overdrive the race car. But he's just been freshly, refreshingly honest. All right, so he's been smart. Here's what has to happen for Jimmy to lock it up. Number one, if he finishes 18th or better, he wins the title no matter what Jeff Gordon does. Jimmy can finish 19th if he leads a lap, 21st if he leads the most laps. He also wins if Gordon finishes 15th or worse. And yesterday, Gordon said, I know last week and I said it's over. That doesn't mean we're going to stop fighting. The pressure here is so monumental, and it's clear why. Now, we know Jimmy is going for five in a row, but nobody has ever finished the season by winning more than two in a row. So give us some historical perspective. If Jimmy Johnson can win this race today, it's very, very likely he's going to win this race today. And if we think about it, in 05, he probably should have won the championship that year. 52 points coming into here, and he had a blown tire. But it puts him in the rarefied air. And I'm talking about Richard Petty, Dale Earnhardt Sr., and also his boss, Jeff Gordon. It puts him in that same company as far as accomplishment. Brad, this guy can win the final race and make it five in a row, Susie, that's for sure. I mean, will he go that hard and try for it? We don't know yet. But, you know, this team has won 10 races this year. And to do that in this style of competition, is just unheard of. It really is. Well, that's the key. What do you think the odds are? Because he and Chad Knauss have really gone for it in every one of these chase races that they stick with the same driving style or change it up a little bit. I, I think he's got to change it up a little bit. I don't think he can be so aggressive and go for it right now. I mean, he just needs to drive this car smart. And he needs to pretend there's landmines all over the racetrack and avoid them all day long. If he hits one of them, he can lose this thing. And Jeff Gordon's going to win it but he's got to be very careful. <laughs> we'll hear from Jimmy Johnson down on the grid in just a little bit. And four hours from now, another Homestead Miami championship moment. Either Jimmy or Jeff will be crowned here. 2002, Tony Stewart led Mark Martin by 89 points entering the season finale. Martin finished fourth, Stewart 18th, but Smoke hung on to win his first title. Little drama in 2003. Matt Kenseth had a mathematically clinched as he was officially declared the final champion of the Winston era at Homestead. In 2004, Kurt Busch won the first ever chase in the closest points finish in series history, just eight points over Jimmy Johnson. In 05, Roush Racing had five drivers in the chase, but they couldn't keep Tony Stewart from winning his second championship in four years. And last year, it was we'll Johnson over who overcame a 156-point deficit in the final six races to capture his first championship. Now, somewhat overshadowed all the championship celebrations, Greg Biffle has won here at Homestead, Miami the last three years in a row, and he is with Dave Burns. Yes, yeah, Susie, that's the pre-Thanksgiving tradition everyone forgets about. Who cares who wins the championship? Greg Biffle wins Homestead. Uh, this weekend, you have the worst starting spot, however, in the last few years here. How do you come from the back here and keep the tradition alive? Well, definitely, you know, where we qualify doesn't reflect what kind of car we have. I got loose getting down in there turn one, and, uh, you know, we had a car that probably qualified in the top 15, so uh, feel bad about that. You know, we just didn't have the setup, but the car's really fast. I think we can come from the back, you know, maybe two-tire stop at the beginning of the race, get some track position, and, uh, you know, it pays the money when the sun goes down and, the, and the, uh, toward the end of the race the, car, the track gets fast, and I think our car's set up for that. At least that's what I've done the last couple of years, so we'll see if uh, it works out tonight. We'll look for the 16 at the end of the race. If he wins here, it'll be his fourth in a row. And Brent, no one's won four in a row at the same track since Jimmy Johnson. Yeah, exactly, Dave. And they're still ahead in this season of change. We'll add insight to the big challenges faced by Tony Stewart, Kyle Busch, and Dale Earnhardt Jr. as we head toward 2008. But before we do that, folks, let's put a bow and tie up 2036 races nine months it is the longest season of any professional sport in the united states but you know each weekend on the nascar circuit is so unique such drama emotion and you talk about amazing pictures
negotiations and intense effort, we decide that it's time for us to move on. My new boss, 2008, Mr. Rick Hendricks. Casey Mears is going to win his first next Cup race. Juan Pablo Montoya wins at Sonoma. Martin Truex wins. The Autism Speaks 400. We got some sad news. Bill France Jr. has passed away. We remember the man who made NASCAR what it is today. I'm gonna find you again. Just I just don't know what we're gonna do now that we don't have him. Love can die. But I know what he wants us to do. Exactly what we're doing here today. I'm gonna do the for the 2007 NASCAR chase of the next Dell Cup. Race number one in the chase, and Clint Boyer becomes the fourth first-time winner. Jimmy Johnson wins his third Las Vegas victory, two in a row. They touch once, twice, drag race. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, Johnson. <laughs> their fourth win of the season, his fifth win of the year. Six in 2007. You never see it coming, my brother. In victory lane for the second time this season here at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Ninth win of the year. Four in a row. NASCAR Countdown on ABC. Brought to you by Chevy, an American Revolution. Monday Night Football on ESPN continues in the thin air a mile high as Vince Young leads the Titans into battle against Jake Cutler and the Broncos. Both teams still in the hunt for division leads. Monday Night Football on ESPN, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Push finale here last night, 4-300. Richard Childress Racing took the owner's title as soon as the number 29 took green. Halfway through the race on pit row. Take a look at this. A crew member for Kelly Byers narrowly misses getting hit by two cars. Look at this again. This is amazing that he jumps right between them. The final lap, Jeff Burton, the number 29 leading, and Burton holds off Mark Martin to win. And talk about ending on a high note. Burton's fifth Bush win of the season. The exclamation point for RCR. Also, the end for Anheuser-Busch, their 26-year sponsorship. Carl Edwards would finish in fourth. He is the Busch Series champ as he does the backflip and hoist the trophy. A four-championship weekend at Homestead Miami Speedway marks the finale for all the NASCAR series and lots of goodbyes to acknowledge today. Beginning with NASCAR's Iron Man, Ricky Rudd will climb out of his car for the final time after a 32-year career, 906 starts, 23 wins. The 1977 Rookie of the Year holds the record for consecutive starts with 788. After a 25-year run, about 600 models of the old car will be obsolete. They can't be converted to COT, so some will be sold to ARCA teams and the like, but at a huge loss, Petty Enterprises is donating some to universities with engineering programs. Tony Stewart and his Joe Gibbs racing teammates say so long to Chevy. After 16 years, they'll be driving Toyota Camrys next year. Kyle Busch takes his last turn to the number five for Hendrick Motorsports. His future is in the number 18 for Gibbs. So goodbye, Tony the Tiger. And hello, M&Ms. And Dale Earnhardt Jr., surely the most emotional farewell to the Red Budweiser number eight at DEI, the team his father founded. So much more than simply stepping out of a car for the last time. And chances of a fairy tale ending don't look good. Like Kyle Petty, Robbie Gordon, Bobby Labonte, and Ryan Newman, it's been a long time since his last win. Dale Jr. has finished 23rd or worse in four of the last six, and his last top 10 was the end of September at Kansas. Last week, he was last after a crash at Phoenix, his ninth DNF of the season. But more than anything, it's about moving on. Dale Jr. is with Alan Bestwick. He is uh, behind the stage awaiting driver introductions now, Susie. Junior, I'm curious, happy, sad thoughts, emotions on the day of your last ride with the only team you've ever driven for professionally. Yeah, we haven't really been looking forward to this day, but, uh, you know, we'll worry all, about all that when the race is over with. But I just want to get a, you know, a couple, my, a couple minutes to say thanks to them guys when it's over. Uh, I want to thank, you know, all the, all the employees back at DEI uh, that are watching for everything they ever did for me and to get me where I am today and uh, all the hard work that 
we all went through and uh, all their families just really appreciate everything they gave me over the last several years but we got to think about this race and get this get this race in do the best we can concentrate on it we got a great chance a good driving car and uh, hopefully we can have some fun before it's over with thanks for the time good luck today thank you unfortunately dale jr's got to start at the back today but he'll go out trying to win susie he sure will and Junior has admitted to the so many what-ifs if his dad was still alive. But, Brad, here we are. Season's just about over. What's your most lasting memory? Well, the whole distraction with the DEI situation. You know, it started out being a business dealing, and then all of a sudden it became a family issue. And, you know, we got involved, and everyone's choosing sides. And I think the person who's been most inaccurately portrayed in all this is Teresa Earnhardt. I mean, she's, been, she's chosen to be very quiet about that, and that's her right. And I think that uh, she's been inaccurately portrayed, and I, th I just think it's a sad situation. You know, Brad, I I'm going to remember a lot of the positive things about DEI. I remember Dale Earnhardt Jr. just leading so many races, running up front. You know, you think about the Brickyard 400 up there dominating. I, I remember Watkins Glen dominating, only to be ruined by some blown engines that this team has never really had problems with in the past. So I guess this year wasn't meant to be. But you know what? DEI's got some speed, and they still got Martin Truex and Mark Martin and guys like that to carry the Dale Earnhardt Sr. banner on, and they'll be just fine. Dale Jr. has one more shot today to get that win. Other things we'll be watching for, races within the race. Top 35 in owner's points, Dave Blaney hanging on to the 35th spot, 136 points up on the 21 of Elliott and Schrader. And there are 12 in the chase, but only top 10 take the stage in New York City in two weeks for the end of season awards. Also to be awarded Rookie of the Year, Juan Pablo Montoya, a big edge over David Reagan. So we'll be watching for all of that today as we roll on. And Rick Hendrick has as many fans as his drivers do from humble small town beginnings to complete domination Hendrick's triumphs and tragedies his story next as the countdown to a championship ticks on you're watching ESPN on ABC aerial coverage of Homestead Miami Speedway brought to you by Goodyear the official tire of NASCAR helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for the past 50 years uh, whether it's Johnson or Gordon holding the Nexo Cup trophy at the end of the day, what we are sure of is that Hendrick Motorsports will collect its seventh championship and that Rick Hendrick should be recognized with the Steinbrenners, Rooneys, and the like as the bedrock of sports ownership. Hendrick is the ultimate American success story. As Dr. Jerry Punch chronicles his journey, you'll see that with every bit of success came despair. Rick Hendrick's philosophy is that three things are needed for success. You must show up, you must show up on time, and show up with your game face on. Based on his life, there could be a fourth thing, show up even in the darkest of times. Everything that he's gone through in his adult life is just very dramatic and very traumatic. When he speaks, you listen, and the reason that you listen to him is because you know what he's gone through, all of his life experiences has got some reason behind it. Born Joseph Riddick Hendrick III, he grew up in the small town of Palmer Springs, Virginia. He was a multi-sport athlete who turned down a chance to play pro baseball. He was no stranger to success, whether it was building his fortune through selling cars or leading his drag boat racing team to three straight national championships. With the help of legendary crew chief Harry Hyde, Hendrick broke into the NASCAR Cup circuit in 1984. We didn't think we could make it through the year without a sponsor. And we won Martin's our eighth race, and Northwestern Security Life came on. And if that hadn't happened, it probably wouldn't be in Hendrick Motorsports, and we wouldn't be here today. In 1995, a little more than 12 years after entering NASCAR, Hendrick Motorsports won its first championship with a car driven by a fresh-faced kid named Jeff Gordon. The next year, another Hendrick driver, Terry Labonte, won the title. But news from a doctor shortly thereafter tempered the celebration. I was diagnosed with leukemia. You're in somewhat of shock. The last thing in the world you expect is for someone to tell you you have a terminal cancer. I kept going by to see him one time, and I went in one day, and he had no color. His face was thrown, and his hands, there was like the bones were showing through his hands. And 
I, st I went outside and started crying because I thought that was the last time I was going to see him. When he was sick, he didn't talk about it a whole lot. Those that knew him well knew that he was going through a, a lot of pain and being ill, and, and it was a tough time, but he, he never showed it. As Hendrick battled leukemia, he was also entangled in a legal battle. In 1996, he was indicted on 15 federal charges for alleged bribes given to Honda officials for the acquisition of new car dealerships. He pleaded guilty to one count of mail fraud in 1997, served a year of home confinement, and was later pardoned by President Bill Clinton. On the track, his teams continued their winning ways, with Gordon adding back-to-back -back cup titles in 1997 and 1998. And by 1999, Hendrick's cancer was in remission. In 2001, Hendrick watched his son Ricky emerge as a driver. Hell yeah! Woo! Never have I been as proud as I was that day when I saw him sitting up there behind the, the mic answering questions about being the youngest guy to ever win a truck race. As quickly as he burst on the scene, Ricky retired as a driver in 2002, choosing instead to focus on the family business. All of that changed, though, on October 24th, 2004. On that day, Rick Hendrick, who was sick at home in Charlotte, got a call that the company plane en route to that week's race had crashed. All 10 people on board were killed, including his brother John and son Ricky. It's a hole in your heart that, you, that never goes away and you, you think about it every day, but there's such a, um, a loss. You had planned this is the way that motorsports was gonna end up and Ricky was gonna take over. I spent a lot of time with Rick away from the racetrack and I don't think it's been a day that Ricky's name doesn't come up in some way or another one. A week later, with Hendrick Motorsports drivers paying tribute to those who had died in the crash, Jimmy Johnson won in Atlanta. And let me remember you all the way. We're watching that on TV, all of the family together, and it was just, I mean, everybody was crying. It was, uh, it was, a, it was a really special deal. Last year, Johnson won his first cup, Hendrick's sixth title overall and first since Gordon's 2001 championship. Now on the verge of his seventh championship, Hendrick still shows up, shows up on time, and shows up with his game face on, even when the losses seem greater than the wins. I don't know how he does it, but he, he still shows up every day with a smile on his face. He leads his automotive industry. He uh, leads the, the race shop like he does, and uh, it's just amazing to watch him. Everybody goes through tough times in life. We've been able to enjoy some of the best times and, and, and some of the toughest times, so it just makes you appreciate every day. Just to hammer this home, in 1984, Rick Hendrick had no driver and no sponsor. Jeff Bodine jumped on board, but there were so many times early in that season, they were this close from never having Hendrick Motorsports. And I'm wondering, Brad, how do you think he's changed the sport? Well, the big thing for Rick Hendrick, and single-handedly, especially through the 80s when the multi-car teams came along, he took a rural sport and, and globalized it. He brought in global entities to sponsor these race cars and got them involved. And it broadened the horizons of NASCAR. He has been a huge, huge force in creating an opportunity for these owners to make a living out of this business. And Brad, he's got such a solid personality. He's just such a wonderful man. All the employees that work in Hendrick Motorsports will tell you, gosh, we just love working for him. You know, if we ever have a problem, we can talk to Rick. And you know what? If we ever need something, Rick's going to get it for us. He wants to win. He wants to be a competitive fella. But above all, he's a genuine nice guy. More than anything, Rick Hendrick has taught us all, it's, it's about choosing the right people and then treating those people the right way. You've got one last race to call. Excited? One more, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> really one, am. One more to go. Absolutely. You know, there are so many details to having a successful team. Picking the right crew chief, like a Chad Canals, is so key to managing it. Our crew chief is Tim Brewer, and he's standing by at the Chevy Cutaway car in the Dish Tech Center with the major adjustments we'll be watching for today.
As a crew chief, we build a lot of adjustability in our cars so we can adjust spring rate during the race. We can actually change rubbers in the springs, putting them in, making them stiffer, removing them, softening them up. We can actually change the weight distribution in the car with the ratchet as far as loading and unloading the load on the springs. Crew chief's favorite thing, air pressure. How many times have you heard, hey, we went down one pound in the right front tire to help the car turn. What that does, when we take a pound of air pressure out of the tire, it takes 60 pounds of spring rate away from the thing, enabling the car to turn better through the middle of the corner. So the best friend a crew chief has got is air pressure gauge. Cutaway Car is brought to you by Chevy, the most wins in NASCAR history in American Revolution. Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon are ready to fight it out. Lennox Lewis knows they're both champs. Straight ahead, how can teammates have such differing results down the stretch? The tale of two teams and what makes them tick coming next. This telecast is available on ABC HD, presented by DLP HD TV. The ceremonies continue here, and as we hear from the Navy rock band Pride out of Jacksonville a little bit, we want to remind you that tonight, the biggest music stars on the planet come together. Live performances by Rascal Flatts, Maroon 5, Lenny Kravitz, Fergie, Rahana, and more. And for the first time ever, your votes will decide who wins the American Music Awards live tonight, right after NASCAR on ABC. And for all those who want a close championship finale, don't give up hope. Jeff Gordon has outpointed Jimmy Johnson by more than 86 points in a single race four times this year. Two of those races were NASCAR's two biggest, the Daytona 500 and the Brickyard 400 in Indianapolis. Both Gordon and Johnson haven't done it alone. They have two of the best crew chiefs in the entire business. have unbelievable talent um, they they apply a completely different way uh, it's hard to see from the outside but uh, Jeff is a, a very calculated driver he's he's uh, a little more emotional than Jimmy stop running into me. I won't have to run into him. Jimmy has actually helped me realize that the highs need to be extremely high but the lows don't have to be as low it's easy for a person to go out there and make a mistake and and do something wrong and cause um, you know, a top five to turn into a top ten or a win to turn into a top fifteen. Jimmy's very good at, at brushing that stuff off and, and refocusing and looking towards the next week. I'm very fortunate to be with Jimmy. I know that 100%. When we first started this team, Jimmy was unheard of. I was unheard of. We really knew that coming into this, this was our opportunity to do something special. We've developed over the years a sense of trust for one another that's just, I think, is phenomenal. If he, if he tells me something, I believe it, period. There's no, there's no second guessing, there's no doubt, and I really feel like it's the same with him. When you're winning, it's easy. You're like, absolutely, I believe you anything you want. But when you struggle, when you get into some slumps, that's when the true challenge comes into play. We can take four tires, pull left side. What do you think? Four tires are better than two, that's for damn sure. Chad made a great pit decision, you know, wins the race. I look at Chad as a mentor, um, especially like this championship race. He does a good job of, of telling me what he was thinking and, and how he went through it. Steve's been there since he was young. I think he was 14 years old when he started there, and he was working in the parts room when I was working in the body shop. Steve is a completely different person than I am. He's uh, not near as intense, uh, doesn't, you know, he, he's laughing, joking, has a good time, and I don't do that. You know, I'm, I'm more of a quiet person, more reserved. We all want to win, we all want a championship. We eat and drink it and sleep it, and it's all we worry about, but when we wake up Monday morning, I'll have my kids, I'll have my wife. Steve Retart, you know, just, just really brought a, a lot of, you know, new ideas and excitement and, and just really helped take this team to that next level. People don't realize that in 2005, we were a top 10 race team at best. We couldn't lead laps, we couldn't win races. I'd love to win the championship, but just to see the fire in his eyes, to go out and win six races, 28 top 10 so far, I mean, we've already had success. I think that the 48 team can be a dynasty. The potential for us to continue to grow as a team and as an organization is there, and, and I look forward to it. Hey, wait, I'm not turning around. 
And we're taking the ride around the track right now, joined by the Bush Series champion, Carl Edwards. And to my left is Jeff Gordon. And last weekend after the race, Jeff said this championship's over. But if you look at the stats, Jeff, it certainly is not. 86 points separate you guys. You've outpointed Jimmy four times by 86. How realistic is that today? Come on, you took me serious on that? I was just joking. No, uh, you know what? We, 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 they've really put it to us the last uh, four races, and, and we recognize that you know they've outperformed us. We've been very consistent this year. We've, we've really done everything we set out to do, and, and you know to, to still be behind in the final race was a little discouraging, but you know we came in here with a fresh mind on do everything we can as a team to come in here, qualify the best we can, get everything out of it in practice so that uh, this DuPont Chevrolet is ready to go for the race. And, and we really, truly are ready for this race. I hate it's not a little bit closer because I'd love to battle Jimmy, you know, just for position. But uh, we know that if they don't have some kind of major problem, uh, you know, we're, we're going to come out of here second, which still isn't bad. It's still been a great year. All right, Jeff Gordon, of course, the hunter today, and he rolls off 11th in pursuit of his fifth NASCAR Cup championship. Jerry? Thank you, Jamie. You know, if you're Jeff Gordon, you must get up at night and say, how can this be? You know, I've got seven poles, six wins, a record time, 29 top 10 finishes. And I look at the charts and I'm not the points leader. How does that impact you or the team mentally? Well, you just heard him say they've done everything they set out to do. They've, they've won all these races. They've, they've put up all these points and they don't come in here with the lead. They come in here 86 points behind. You're thinking, man, what have I got to do? They look next door and their, you know, their teammate has just outperformed them and that's all they can do. They can just go out here, do the best they can, try to win this race today and then let happen what happened. You know, Jeff Gordon certainly has had a great year. And Brent Musburger, to put it in perspective, the Colorado Rockies also had a great year. But uh, when it came down to the title chase, there was one team just a little bit better. As you've always said, Doc, class tells. And you know, two lucky fans will be watching the race from the Sprint Million stage today. Depending on who wins the next Dell Cup, Jimmy Johnson or Jeff Gordon, one of them will walk away with $1 million from Sprint. Both Johnson and Gordon fighting today to take home this next L Cup. Johnson took home his first last season. Up next, he will be joined by Susie with his final thoughts before we go green at Homestead. And we'll be back in a moment with more from NASCAR Countdown at Homestead Miami Speedway after these messages and a word from your local ABC stations. The Miami Homestead Speedway, where today we will settle the chase for the next Dell Cup. A sellout crowd, and why not? The Miami Dolphins long ago spit the bit on this NFL season. All eyes now in South Florida are focused on Homestead. You know, Jimmy Johnson is red hot. He's the first driver to win four straight races since 1998 when Jeff Gordon did it. He's also only the eighth driver to win four straight in NASCAR's modern era, dating back to 1972. Now, no driver has won five straight in NASCAR's modern era as in ever. Can't do it alone. Got a great crew chief in Chad Knauss. And so let's go down to Susie Calva right now. Susie. <laughs> well, the grid is so crowded. Jimmy Johnson is making his way down here. Chad Knauss, a more than able fill-in. <laughs> You know, we know that Jimmy has been talking about all week long trying to keep that nervousness at bay. How have you seen him react to things just during the weekend? I think he's done really well. The thing that I think that we do the best is when we get into the competitive environment, I think we're able to block everything out. So it's, it's really nice. Uh, obviously, when Jimmy straps into the car and gets his helmet on, he'll be able to be focused and, and one-minded and go out there and do what he needs to do. And, you know, the same, same for me. Once I get up on top of the pit box and put my headset on, we'll be business as usual, I hope. What's the biggest concern? Just obviously finishing. Uh, we saw some mechanical issues with the truck race, and we saw a lot of accidents yesterday in the bush race. So just making sure that we complete 267 laps and being there at the end and, you know, hopefully going for the win. You guys have been going for it. Does the driving style have to change? No, not really. I think that if you've watched the way we've been all year long, uh, Jimmy's done a really good job of waiting to the end of the race, and we've done a good, really good job in the pits with the guys and great pit stops and, and good adjustments on the race car. So at the end, we've got the best car that we can possibly have, and, and that's kind of our goal. And if we can pull that off, it's going to be exciting. Best of luck. Whoever's going to win today is going to have to go through the 48 team. Now let's go to opening ceremonies. Race fans, ladies and gentlemen, will you please rise and remove your hats as the Homestead Air Reserve Base Honor Guard presents our nation's colors. And will you please welcome Miss Florida 2007, Kylie Williams, as she delivers today's invocation. 
Heavenly Father, we give thanks for such a glorious day to celebrate the NASCAR season finale. We pray for the safety of our drivers, their families, and the international and national fans that have come to support their champions. We also offer our thoughts and prayers for the family of former NASCAR chairman Bill Francis, Jr. In closing, we would like that you would watch over our serving men and women as they defend our freedoms. It is in your precious and heavenly name we pray. Amen. And now, will you please remain standing and welcome double platinum recording artist from Fuel, Torian Green, as he performs our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the daunting light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight all the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star span servicemen and women who are serving us so very proudly around the globe. It is about time now to go green. The last race of this next hell season. Number 36. 14,000 miles. Dr. Jerry Punch, how long before we show up in Daytona, my friend? It is not very long at all, Brandon. We're excited about uh, finishing up 2007 and moving into 2008. It has all come down to two drivers, one race and one championship. All 12 of these positions could change today. Depending upon the outcome of this race, only two guys can battle for a title. 86 points separate Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon. And how quickly could that change? Well, folks, take a look. Four times this year, Jeff Gordon has outpointed Jimmy Johnson by 88 points or more. And, folks, right here two years ago, Gordon gained 100 points on Jimmy Johnson. If he does that today, he will leave at the 2007 Next L Cup Championship. Teams focused, teams concentrating, teams thinking about what this day could mean. It has been a ten and a half month season, and it will end up four hours and 400 miles from now. Over, everyone along with Rusty Wallace and uh, Andy Petrie, the champions, I'm Jerry Punch. Glad to have you with us. And uh, Rusty, in your career here, you've experienced exactly what these drivers are feeling today. Now, you've come into the final race of the season as a chaser like Jeff Gordon. You've also come in as a uh, as a chasey like points leader Jimmy Johnson. You know, how does the pressure differ for these two guys? It's extreme different, Jerry. It really is. You take a look at Jimmy Johnson right now. He needs to do what he's been doing all year long that got him here. Although, he can't trust anybody. He's going to be very careful what's going on around him in order to win this championship. On the other hand, Jeff Gordon, this guy's got nothing to lose. He's got to stand in a throttle and go wide open. Unless something happens to Jimmy Johnson, then the whole thing changes again, and then it's in, then it's in Jeff's shoes to be careful and do what he's got to do to win this title. Andy, you led Dale Earnhardt Sr. to two cup titles as a crew chief. What's the mindset of these crew chiefs, Chad Knauss versus Steve Latart? Well, it's real easy with Steve Latart because he's just going to go out there and race, gamble, do whatever it takes to win. For Chad Knauss, it's a little different. He's got the championship to worry about and something else, five races in a row he can win right here. So he's in a unique situation that nobody has been in. It's going to be interesting to see just how he does handle this race. I can't wait to see how it unfolds. It's going to be very exciting to watch.
What does history tell us about today? Well, folks, only twice in the modern era of NASCAR has a driver overcome a deficit in the final race to capture the title. Kowicki did it. Richard Petty did it. But you know what they say, folks? The third time is the charm. Just moments away from the start of the 4 400 grid, there's a sense of anticipation. There's a championship about to be rewarded between Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon. A sense of relief by these crew members as a long season is about to end. And a sense of anticipation. Somebody's going to win this race and ride three months of momentum until the next race at Daytona in February. It's all about to get started right now as we go to the head of the grid for the command to start engines and get this race going. Race fans! On behalf of Ford Motor Company and Ford fans everywhere, ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. Break them up, King. Break them up. Start it up. Break it up. Okay, fire it up. All right, guys. Uh, just appreciate everything this year. I really do appreciate all the hard work. All the guys at the shop, all you guys, I appreciate it. And uh, we should squat here. Have a good time. Have a good holiday season here. So uh, just thanks again. 43 of NASCAR's finest are buckled up and ready. And, folks, 400 miles from now, we are going to crown a Cup Series champion. Take a look at our starting grid. Points leader Jimmy Johnson starts the race today where he's finished the last four weeks in a row at the head of the grid. He'll be flanked by Penske Dodge driver Ryan Newman. By the way, Jeff Gordon will start back in 11th position. Now, while you watch to see where your favorite driver will start, let's visit with our in-race reporter. We're going to finish the year right the way we began the year, visiting with uh, the driver of the Office Depot Ford, Carl Edwards, who starts 10th today. Hey, Carl Edwards, Rusty Wallace, ESPN. You got us? Rusty, I got you. I just talked to your brother Mike. Hey, buddy. Hey, Carl, you had the chance to race last night in the Bush race, and, you, man, you ran great. You finished fourth. Hey, what did you learn that's going to help you here tonight? I learned that the track is going to change just a little bit, but not quite the same way I thought it was going to change when the sun went down. So um, hopefully that helps us tonight. But um, you know, we got a great car. The guys have been doing a good job. We qualified better than normal. And uh, I want to dedicate this, uh, this race tonight to my, my buddy Bob Healy's family. He passed away yesterday. He's a car guy, a good guy. And uh, hopefully we can have a good showing for him and all our fans. Hey, Carl, last night we watched the leader of the race last night spin on that narrow pit road coming to the pits. I mean, does that area got you concerned? Yeah, you're uh, you're right, man. I didn't have to make a, uh, a green flag pit stop. I watched, you know, I watched Kevin Harvick go down there and just get all over the brake. I saw, you know, uh, David Reagan lost it coming on the pit road, you know, just doing everything he could. It's, uh, it's a tough pit road, so I'm going to be real cautious, especially if this car is real good. That's a bad place to make up time the way it looks. All right, buddy, man, you have a great race. We'll talk to you later on. All right, cool, Rusty. Nice talk to you. Talk to you later. Well, a man who has led Carl Edwards to three wins on the season this year, his crew chief, Bob Osborne. Let's visit with Bob. Hey, Bob Osborne. Andy Petrie up here in the booth. You got a copy? Sir, Andy, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Bob. Hey, this, you know, this track's going to cool down a lot tonight as the sun goes down. How do you expect that to uh, affect the balance of the cars? Well, I uh, expect the, the track to free up a little bit. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So you're saying the track's going to loosen up as we go? Yeah. Yeah, I sure hope it does for how we're set up right now. <laughs> well, that's not the way I thought it would go. I thought it might tighten up, but that's, uh, that's another angle we'll be looking for, and uh, we appreciate you talking to us, Bob. Have a good race. You too. Thank you. Carl Edwards has started three times at Homestead Miami Speedway, and he has uh, two top ten finishes, but has yet to go to victory lane. We'd like to change that here today. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations.
Sunny South Florida, Homestead Miami Speedway. Let's update some of the key stories we'll be following today as we head down to the pits. First, here's Jamie Little. Well, Doc, all the talk has been about the 24 and 48. How about a contender who's really hit his stride the last four races? Matt Kenseth has moved from 12 to 6 in the points. Now, I talked to his crew chief, Robbie Reiser, sitting right in front of me, and he told me they feel they are the only team that has truly challenged the 48 the last four weeks. He expects nothing different tonight. They have nothing to lose. They're going for the win, and they're also racing with a little added emotion. After a 10-year union of driver and crew chief, this is the last race that Robbie Reiser will be on top of the pit box for Matt Kenseth. They're going all out. They want to finish on a high note with the victory. Let's go to Mike Massaro. Well, Jamie, for Jeff Gordon, the drive for five has been a long and at times seemingly endless journey. It has been six years since his fourth and most recent title. And once again, the path to an elusive fifth crown has hit a crossroads. After falling 86 points behind a week ago in Phoenix, Jeff Gordon said, quote, it's over. This week, though, he backed down and said, we're not going to give up without a fight. But to win the championship, he'll have to overcome history. No eventual champion has overcome a deficit larger than 30 points in the final race to claim the championship. Jeff Gordon is trying to do that. Can he pull off the Miami miracle? We'll find out in just 400 miles. Dave? Mike, this is Jimmy Johnson's pit box at the head of pit road. Today, it can accurately be called the nerve center of the 48 team. Here the data is stored that's been collected over years of racing and the 2007 season that's made this 48 team so successful. Strategists and engineers have put that information together and will try to apply it tonight to the 48 car with the help of their driver. On the track, Jimmy Johnson will be communicating data all night long to his crew. But in NASCAR, there's no direct electronic data link between drivers driver and crew. That means that they'll have to do the best they can with Jimmy on the track from the pit box. And that's where the human nerves come in. These very smart people will be going crazy all night long, not knowing exactly what's going on with the 48 car. Doc? How pumped is that team right there to win this championship? And what kind of leader is Chad Knauss? Let's listen in to the radio. Guys, let's go out there and have some fun today. The short race, 400 miles, 267 laps. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Nice and easy, guys, just like what you did last week. 13 and a half second pit stop, so I'll get that done, just like I told you guys in the meeting. Thanks for your help this year, guys. I really appreciate it. Lots of confidence on that team as they prepare to try to win two titles in a row. On to onboard cameras, eight high definition onboard cameras today. We'll be riding along with the number 11 car, Denny Hamlin, starts 32nd in the FedEx Freight Chevy. Kevin Harvick starts eighth in the Shell Penzo Chevrolet. Jeff Burton starts ninth, the AT&T Chevy. Dale Jarrett starts 26th in the UPS Toyota. Ricky Rudd, 38th in the Snickers Ford, is 906th and final start in an illustrious 32-year career. Tony Raines, 42nd, the Texas Instruments DLP Chevrolet. Carl Edwards, our in-race reporter, already heard from, 10th in the Office Depot Ford. And Clint Boyer starts 19th, the direct TV on board camera. Two drivers trying to win a championship. Jimmy Johnson has the points lead, the confidence, all the momentum. Four wins in a row. Jeff Gordon, the experience, the focus, and the fire in the belly to win his fifth championship. Star-studded field. Final race of the year. Seven former Cup champions, five former Homestead winners, and two Indy 500 champions as the green flag waves at Homestead Miami. the points leader he is the hunted and right now Jimmy Johnson's dead on the bottom of the racetrack we saw last night the Bush Series race that was not the groove you wanted to run you want to be on top of the wall but Newman turns him loose let's Jimmy Johnson take the lead check that off that's five points that Jimmy Johnson needs right there he put that in the bank and now he can just go down and make just start getting down the race Started to say that Newman was really roughing him up for a little while. Just wouldn't let him have that lead. Sailed down to back straight into turn three, guys. But now Johnson's kind of thought a little different. He's just backing up a little bit, being a little conservative now, and letting Newman, it looks like Matt Kenseth, go for it right now. It, it looks just like it, that Jimmy Johnson just backed off the throttle and said, okay, I got those five points. I'm just going to sit here and be not so much conservative, but I'm not going to be as aggressive early. 
Here's Jeff Gordon starting back in 11th position. Now he will try to pick them off one at a time on the inside of the 31 car. That's Jeff Burton. Remember, Jeff Gordon has to get there. He's got to get there and lead as many laps as he can and try to win this race in order to have a shot at catching Jimmy Johnson for the championship. Alvin Bester. Doc, let's talk about the condition of this 24 car after the final practice yesterday. When he gets down to turns one and two, the middle of the corners there were what crew chief Steve Latar told me this morning. They were trying to improve with the adjustments they made in the garage, but they needed to do that without making the back end too out of control getting into turn three. Watch the center of one and two there and the entrance to turn three as there's a challenge for the lead as you watch that 24 car. But guys, right now, the 17 car, Matt Kenseth, he's been strong the last three or four weeks. A lot of second place finishes, third place finishes. He's been very, very fast. And we said early, if this guy qualifies good, he always races good. And Andy right now is proving us right. Taking the lead now. And that's not, you know, Matt Kenseth is the guy that usually shows up late. Uh, and, but he gets his car right, but he's got his car right early here. Almost makes me wonder a little bit about his setup later in the race when this thing's going to cool down and uh, these guys may have to adjust on it because he looks awful good right now. Well, we saw last night the whole complexion of the race really changed when the sun went down and the track cooled off, and that's where the drivers are going to have to keep up with, especially Jimmy Johnson and Jeff Gordon if Gordon's got a shot. Kansas trying to hold on to the lead, the 12 car of Ryan Newman. It has been a long time since Newman has gone to victory lane. Ryan Newman trying to get back there. 80 races ago, New Hampshire, back in September of 2005, the last time a driver that 12 car has been able to celebrate. He'd like to do it here in the final race of 2007. Yeah, Newman really loved to close the deal finally here at Homestead. He's just had such a struggle the last couple years trying to get this car to handle, but this is his style of racetrack. It's fast, it's high bank, and that's what Newman really likes. See these guys already using the whole racetrack all the way up against the wall down to the line, down to the white line on the bottom. Well, I really expect them to do that right now, Andy, because the track is kind of hot and slick at the moment. You know, when it cools down, the whole thing's going to change. But what we saw last night, those guys right up against the wall, and that was the fast way around this place. Yeah, you see Matt Kenseth coming off this corner, and he was all the way against the wall. And there's the 31. He has been real high on the, in the corners. Jeff Burton. Really 31, Burton rushed the wall. You see him slowing down now. He was running in the ninth position. Teammate Clint Boyer going by, looking back at Kevin Harvick. Guys, it looks like Burton actually brushed the wall a little bit, got some rub on the right front tire, looks like. Let's take a look at this again. He sails off into turn one, and he just gets a little too high in the rear and gets off underneath of it. Well, here's the problem with running high this early in the race. That groove's going to be real good all the way up to the wall later. But early in the race, there's a lot of sand, a lot of grit. These guys got to clean it off. And Jeff Burton, that's, that's where he ran all night last night in the bush race, and I'm sure that's where he wanted to go early in this race. But the track just wasn't ready yet. Well, right now, Burton's just hoping like crazy for a caution flag to get back into this because he's got smoke coming off the right front tire to 31 Chevrolet. Yeah, by the way, Jeff Burton won that NASCAR Bush Series race here last night. Yeah, more on Jimmy Johnson as we head down today. And already you guys have talked about using all of the grooves on this racetrack. There was one piece of, or one person involved with data communication that I didn't mention in my earlier story. It's the eye in the sky, the guy on top of the roof, Stevie Reeves, the spotter, who is participating already, giving the important information to Jimmy Johnson that the field has cleaned off the track. All grooves available, everywhere has grip use the track where you want to. Well, except for that one little spot Jeff Burton found <laughs> getting in the corner, it's all pretty good. But uh, it'll take a little while for that last six or, you know, six feet or six inches of the track to really get clean up there. Andy, that's pretty good advice, though, from the, the spotter because the spotter's watching everything. And for the most part, the track is cleaned up. But, boy, right on the top on the entry of one and two is where Burton got in trouble. You can't get that high this early. KCK now moving into position in the four spots so looking for win number one in 2007. Already been a tough weekend for Casey Kane involved in an incident. Investigations ongoing between Casey and an unidentified security guard here at the Speedway on Friday. And a spokesman for Kane said he was headed back to the motorhome lot with his fire suit on and a guard stopped him. There was a concern over a, a, a credential for his brother and the security guard ended up, I guess they bumped each other, went to the ground and it's an ongoing investigation. NASCAR also, by the way, looking in to this incident that took place on Friday here at Homestead, Miami. Early laps here, lap number 10 of 267. Matt Kenseth, the early leader, Newman, Johnson, Kane, and Kurt Busch in the top five. You're watching ESPN on ABC.
Welcome back to the Ford 400 NASCAR Nextel Cup Series season finale. Homestead Miami Speedway, sixth consecutive year NASCAR has come here to crown a champion at the finish line of this 400 mile event. Two car, Kurt Busch on the move. There, there's the two car, Kurt. Being able to go by Jimmy Johnson to take away the third position. Matt Kenza still the leader. Ryan Newman, his Penske teammate, in second spot. The next one to get to that 48 is going to be the 24. Watching his lap times are pretty quick, too. They're just about as quick, if not quicker, than Kurt Busch. So he's on the move also. Yeah, you can tell Jeff Ward's on it right now. He's been running the bottom of the racetrack, a pretty unusual line for the most part. But Jimmy Johnson chasing Kurt Busch right now. Notice he's a little more conservative. Take a look at the 31 guys. He bumped the wall early, and now the right front tires went down on him. There it goes. He's just got to watch the entry of Pitt Road now. We watched David Reagan spin out there last night in the Busch Series race. It's very oh, narrow yeah, pit road. You never want to have this kind of trouble, but it's, if you're going to have it, this is the time. Have it early where you can make all this time back up. And Burton's done a good job getting this car on pit road. If he goes a little faster, he's going to blow the right Whoa. front fender off Tony with the Stewart. car coming apart. Tony Stewart saw in that wheel. Jamie Little. And Jeff Burton in his pit box. Of course, guys, you saw him get a little high. He said it's his right front went down. They had a little bit of fender damage. So Jeff Burton came in, said it's definitely the right front, guys. Fix it. Pull that fender out. You see him doing it there on the left-hand side. Very costly for Jeff Burton, guys. Well, Jamie, you could tell that was going to be a problem early on because when he got in the wall, we saw a lot of smoke off that right front tire, and it kept going. And I was very nervous that this thing might go down, and it finally did. But now... He's just got to make the ground up. He's going to have a lot of ground to make up. He's losing his second lap right here as these leaders go by. So what he's got to do now is try to get this car back out there and get him in position to get that lucky dog. Because right now, he's the only car that's down a lap. Yeah, he's got an opportunity to get that done right now. Andy, as you said, he's the only one down a lap. So if the caution flies, he's back in the game. And he needs a caution very quickly. Now, how about the 20 car? We talked about how good the 24 car is. Both these cars sailing now. The 20, Tony Stewart started back in 14th position. He and uh, Jeff Gordon both running laps uh, extremely well. 33-15s, 33-10s, and that is quicker than Ken's at the leader. We can tell right away that Stoney, Tony Stewart had a good car, man. He went right to the top of the track. A lot of momentum up there. He's working the bottom. He's working the top. And he's won here before. He knows how to get around this place. He's won here before, but I don't. he's never won on this configuration. That's the only thing he's got to figure out is how to work this banking now. I guess what I meant, I think he's yeah. won the championship here, though, in this particular configuration on this track. So, yeah, it's... Uh, he knows he's mile and a half. He's probably loving it out there right now. Yeah, he won the very first two events they ran here back in 1999 and 2000 when it was four and six degrees of banking. Now it's a progressive 18 to 20 degrees. The one car, Martin Truex, there in a battle with our in-race reporter, Carl Levert, as these guys battle for seventh spot. Jerry, when he unloaded here on Friday afternoon for the very first practice session, he told us, he said, this is the best car I've had all year long. This thing feels good. It's fast. And right now, we just got to see if it's going to stay that way because he has not yet been able to practice this car at night yet. Dave? And guys, right now, as we're getting a report, uh, maybe there's something going on with the 24. The one car had a scare yesterday in final practice. He had just told his crew chief, Photo Mannion, that the top line was running great for him. And on the final lap of final practice, he scraped the wall right in there somewhere between turns one and two. They repaired the whole right side of that car and got it back together. But uh, Bono said, we think we'll have a pretty good race car, but that was close. Man, take a look at the two-car per Kurt Busch and the 12-car Ryan Newman, the teammates. They're actually running down Matt Kenseth just a little bit right now. And these guys want to end the year on a high note. Kurt Busch has already won this year, but Newman, he's on a dry spell. Kurt Busch won here from the pole in 2002. Remember, he came here in 2004 as the pole sitter went on to win a championship by a scant eight points over Jimmy Johnson. So he's had pretty good success here. Trying to get up a win here at the end of the year. And the guy behind him, we told you about how Ryan Newman's now had an 80 race to ice spell. How much does he want to win for uh, for not only for himself, but for this Penske operation? Well, he knows he's got one shot to go in that situation. He's got to get it done today if it's going to happen this year, that's for sure. The Ford of Matt Kenza showing the way here in the early laps. Uh, a couple of dodges behind him, Kurt Busch and Ryan Newman. And then three Chevrolets, Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon, and Tony Stewart with uh, Martin Truex closing in a hurry. 24 laps are complete. Back with more from Homestead in a moment.
broadcast is available in Spanish by activating your SAP button presented by ESPN Deportes. Early laps, Homestead Miami Speedway. Matt Kenseth, the leader. Kurt Busch in second spot. There is a 17 car Kenseth. Four consecutive top five finishes here in the chase. Uh, if it wasn't for Jimmy Johnson, he probably would have won two or three of those races. Kenseth trying to end the season on a, a win here at Homestead Miami. A couple of guys behind him, Kurt Busch and Newman, the two Penske teammates. How about the one car, Martin Truex Jr.? This is the car he set on the pole with at Texas a couple of weeks ago. Led so many laps at Atlanta, finished second at Michigan twice. And this car should have won four races if I had any luck at all. And he is driving the wheels off of it early on here at uh, Homestead, Miami. Jerry, this car is so fast right now, it's almost stupid. He's like three-tenths of a second faster than anybody out there. He's dead on the top of the racetrack. And Andy, watch him here go past Johnson. I mean, this thing is just flying right now he's got that groove that upper groove working better than anybody he's way way up there and he's uh, it's very risky up there but it's super fast right now I mean he's got 236 laps to go and he's on the wall every single lap I mean to me it doesn't give you any room for air he's already hit the wall in practice they had to down there this morning we just heard him talking about it the whole right side was beat up they had to re-decal it fix all the fenders and uh, I, I, my, I'm going to predict that he's going to hit it again before the day's over as close as he's running to that wall. How big would this be, though, for DEI? Everyone's talking about Dale Earnhardt Jr. leaving after this race and going away to Hendricks Motorsports. But in terms of momentum internally for Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, the, the organization, if they can get a win here with Truex or even the eight car. It, it would be huge for these guys to win, especially if the one car was to win because he's going to be the leader. He's going to take over the leadership role of that team. And for him to go out of here with a win would be huge. Although this car right here, Dale Earnhardt Jr., he needs a win bad. Started all the way at the back of the pack. They had a transmission change, and they had to go to the rear of the field. He has now clicked off, what, 21 position. Earnhardt Jr., all the way up to 20th spot. Dave. And, Doc, here's why they had to go. To, here's why they changed their transmission, why it broke. It's crazy. He's had such a bad year that his garage selection this weekend was all the way down towards turn four. The cars exit the track, and the guy in the very last garage area has to make a hard U-turn to get into his garage stall. You can't do it. Junior had to back up, go forward, back up, go forward. People were getting clogged up behind him. He had to hurry. Eventually, using reverse all that much in practice, it wore out. That's why they had to change the transmission by NASCAR rules. They had to start at the rear. Well, you talk about DEI. I mean, I just got to believe this team is going to be so strong next year with Mark Martin and all the drivers that got driving that car. And Truex, guys, week after week has been so strong in that one car. Let me tell you what, DEI racing is not in trouble at all. Making a lot of horsepower, they'll fix their problems, and they'll be just as good as ever. They indeed will be. And how about the guy right behind Earnhardt Jr.? That is Greg Biffle, and they can rename this race the Greg Biffle Invitational. He has won it the last three consecutive years. Here goes Truex. He's going to get another spot. This is going to be for second spot or third spot. Yeah, you take, a look at this car. you take a look at this number one car, Mark Truex, the way it's, the way it's running right now. Does it look like DEI's in trouble to you? <laughs> Not to me. This thing looks great out there. Not at all. And remember now that Mark Martin will share that eight car next year for DEI with U.S. Army calls on it. He and Eric Almarola will split that car. So uh, they're going to be awfully stout in 2008. I'll tell you what, if he quits, if, if he start, stays running so high and gets in that wall, he's going to be in trouble. I wish he'd give that wall just a little bit of a breathing room, Andy. This last time by, about six inches off the wall. What about our championship teammates and contenders? Jimmy Johnson, Jeff Gordon. They are running fifth and sixth in that order. There's Jimmy Johnson. He has led a lap. So remember, he get those, already gets those five bonus points by the very first lap. And uh, behind him, a pretty good sign by Sad Battle, a 24 car of Gordon trying to hold off Tony Stewart. You know, you know the fastest way around a racetrack, Andy, I mean, uh, the shortest way around, I mean, is dead on the bottom of the racetrack. But it seems to me the fastest way is dead on top of the track. We're watching Martin Truex with all that momentum really flying off at turn two and really flying off at turn four. And why Gordon's dead on the bottom right now, I don't well, have a clue. Well, some of these guys are making time on the bottom. We saw the, the A-car junior. He usually runs the top and runs it well. I just saw him running the bottom for many, many laps. He's made up a lot of ground. But uh, in 24 cars was going forward on the bottom. And it seems like when the tires wear out, the groove, the preferred groove does move all the way to the top of the track. Though. More on Jeff Gordon, Alan Best. Well, here might be a reason why he might be running the bottom, Rusty. Jeff Gordon has reported the front end of his car losing grip under throttle. So that means in the center of the corner, when he gets back to the gas, the front end starts to slide, so he needs more room to exit the corner, and if that front end was ripping properly, maybe he's moved to the bottom to give himself that more room, so he doesn't have to get out of the gas, leaving the corner, and lose more time than he would otherwise. Well, that's a good, that's 
good explanation right there. I know if the front end slide and you go at the corner 200 miles an hour and turn the wheel, that thing doesn't turn. You're going to hit the wall. But right now, doing what he's doing, he's about a half a second slower than Martin Truex Jr., who is the fastest car on the track right now. Jeff Gordon needs room to slide and room to race here, trying to get a championship, trying to reel in his teammate, Jimmy Johnson. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Welcome back to Homestead Miami Speedway. NASCAR Next Dell Cup Series season finale. We're getting ready to crown a champion here. These aerial shots from high above, courtesy of our good friends at Goodyear. The official tire of NASCAR, helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for over 50 years. Matt Kens is still our leader. Kurt Busch in second. Martin Truex is now third. Ryan Newman is fourth. Tony Stewart has moved up to fifth position, all the way back from 14th starting spot. Doc, we've been talking about Martin Truex and Matt Kenseth a little bit now. We talked about how fast Truex has been, but now the last couple laps, Kenseth has actually matched his time, so it looks like he's not catching now. They're really holding their own. And right there, Kurt Busch is just hanging in right in the middle. Those lap times are varying back and forth a little bit, but it appears now the two fastest cars in the field are the one car Truex and Kenseth. But what about Jeff Gordon, the 24 car? We told you Gordon has had four consecutive wins and built an 86-point lead. It's been a while since Jeff Gordon has been able to go by the 48. But guess what here? He's doing it at Homestead Miami Speedway on the day that he has to do it and make it work. Jerry, we talked a little bit about these cars have been so good and the drivers have been so smart. The teams have been so good. But a lot of times they don't have the fastest race cars in the field, although they end up up front. Andy, right now, they're getting beat by almost four tenths of a second on the racetrack. And that's a lot. It is a lot, but it's early. Yeah. These guys seem to be good when it counts at the end of the race. And that's what you'll see here. With these guys, they don't have the fastest car the whole day. They work on their cars. They keep working on them until they're the fastest when they need them to be. Early wow. in this race, how about a couple of guys here that uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. will be driving uh, for Hendrick Motorsports next year. And how about Earnhardt Jr. just sailing by the five of Kyle Busch? It looked like Kyle Busch cut the switch off and they came <laughs> off that corner. That's just a real uh, illustration of how that momentum works here. Junior was running that bottom line earlier. Now he's got that thing all the way against the wall. And boy, you see that back of that car just kind of jumping around. I mean, him and Martin Truex are doing exactly the same thing. Same type of chassis, dead on top. Check out our sprint speed lap here. Dale Earnhardt Jr. sprinting toward the front. Remember, folks, he started back in 41st position. His last lap over 160.3 miles an hour and uh, much quicker than the leader as the last uh, three consecutive time winner here, Biffle on pit road. Mike? And Greg Biffle real happy with his race car thing. Just a tick tight in center groove, but when he gets up high, a little bit loose there. No significant adjustments to the 16 car. Four tires and fuel. Jim? And Matt Kessler has been leading his first lap here at Homestead, he said his car is just right in three and four, a little tight, and one and two, slide adjustment, four tires, he's down and away. Mike? Carl, Carl Edwards has been adjusting his brake bias throughout the course of this first run, still very happy with his race car, they'll make an air pressure adjustment, also raise the track bar because he feels it's a little bit tight in turns one and two, and has no grip in turns three and four. They're down and away after a four tire change. Man, the whole field is hitting pit road. Now, here's Martin Truex on pit road, and they <laughs> looks like about lap 48, 49 is all they can run on fuel. Let's go down to Dave. The car wants to spin out in turns three and four. That's a report from the driver, but that is a fast situation right now for Martin Truex. They will change four tires. It'll be an air pressure adjustment for Truex in the one car. Meanwhile, Jimmy Johnson also coming down pit road as his team waits for him as he comes into a stop right now. Jimmy's reporting his car is tight in the center of the corners. That will get a chassis adjustment. The wrench is going in both sides. Those are wedge adjustments, air pressure as well. Chad Canals telling his driver, we'll try to free you up a little bit, buddy. Tires going on the left-hand side, and now he leaves pit road. Alan. And you see Kurt Busch on the left-hand screen pitting from second place where he's running before the round of pit stops started. Trouble in turn two, trouble in the pit entrance. A car, Dale Earnhardt Jr. Sideways, you see him getting back on the racetrack. The 29 of Harvick down there trying to avoid trouble as well. And caution comes out as you see Jeff Gordon in the pits for his first stop of the day. Left side tires, Steve Letard and crew are going to get four tires on. You hear most of these guys complaining of the cars being tight. All clear, all clear, 42 to the cone, 42 to the cone. It's going to shuffle them up a little bit because all of them had not made their pit stops. 
Yeah, I got half of them on the racetrack, half of them on pit road right now, Andy. This has got everything totally confused right now when it comes to pit strategy. Folks, Jimmy Johnson, it would be a lap down right now by virtue of making that pit stop and others that haven't pitted yet. Now, let's show you what happened here trying to get on the pit road. We talked to Carl Edwards. He's our in-race reporter about this narrow pit road is very tough. And we saw a race leader last night, David Reagan, spin, but he gets hit. He's on or out in the dirt. He's trying to get back in. Massive melee at the entry of pit road here at Homestead. That was Kyle Busch in the five car that got into the eight car of Earnhardt Jr. You saw Patrick Carpentier was there as well in the 10. There's the damage on the left rear of the eight car. And we are being told that NASCAR is going to call the eight and 29 in for commitment cone violations. Once you come to that commitment cone, you got to come on the pit road. And he, just, he came back on the well, racetrack. They, they definitely violated the, the <laughs> commitment cone. They were both crashing as they went by. You had to you avoid know, that eight car not to hit him in the side door there. You know, you know what I mean? Hey, you got these leaders right here. They, they, like Tony Stewart wanted to pit, but you have to pit from the from the uh, access road. You can't come in off the racetrack right there. You have to come in off of the end of the back straightaway in turn three. So had he turned down pit road, he would have had a commitment right. cone violation. That's kind of confusing here at this racetrack because it looks like you can come right off the track on a pit road, but NASCAR requires these guys to use the access road, just like you saw where the eight and the five car got together. You know, it makes you wonder. We saw last night in the Boost Series race when David Reagan spun out and crashed on the entry. It's got to be in these drivers' mind because this road is so narrow. I mean, there's many cars sliding off in the dirt trying to pit. Looks like his five cars got some damage. He's got a lot of damage on that headlight door. Alan? Kyle Busch is one of those guys who had not yet pitted before that caution came out, which could turn out to be a good break. We'll have to wait and see. He does have some damage behind the left front wheel and in front of the left front wheel. They've got fender damage there from contact. You see them also working around the right front side of the car. So no damage on this machine from that whole uh, scramble there. Uh, just uh, that brought the caution out in the middle of the green flag stops. And that's too bad. Casey Kane, when Kyle Busch went by him on the racetrack, said that five car is going to win the race tonight. He had a good run going in the early part. Now Oh, those fenders, eh, it's going to be hard on a fast track like this with those aerodynamics all messed up. Alan, uh, Tony the Tiger there on the hood a little bit bent up here. Watch the violation. Now watch tr trying to see here. Here's the eight of Earnhardt Jr. That was a cone. They went back up on the racetrack. So the uh, 29 and 8 commitment cone violations. Nine cars up front have not yet pitted, including Ryan Newman, Tony Stewart, Juan Pablo Montoya, Reed Sorensen and company. And here they come on the pit road. They slow down at 45 miles an hour for their first stop of the day. Jamie. And Tony Stewart, of course, wanted to come in until the caution came out, but he said his car's really, really tight, and he said it's really tough to see as they enter pit road with that sun setting now. Uh, definitely visibility an issue for Tony Stewart. He's just going to make a slight adjustment, and we're going to go to Mike Massaro. And the 42 car reacting just the way Donnie Wingo expected it to. Started off a little bit loose, then tightened up. No adjustments, just four tires and fuel. They New leader Ryan Newman gives it up to come down pit road. His car just a little bit tight. They make a track bar and air pressure adjustment. The main concern was, do you have enough fuel to make it around? Driver saying, I've still got fuel pressure on his way down pit road. Good pit stop on Ryan Newman's group as he will come back out. Off of pit road is leader. Juan Pablo Montoya has had a good car all weekend here. Chip Ganassi, Felix Avadis excited about what Juan Pablo could do. It was this race a year ago that he made his very first Cup Series start. And, of course, Clint Boyer up a couple of spots. Under caution for the first time today, back with the restart at Homestead, Miami in a moment. Here at Homestead, Miami, we're under caution for the first time today. An incident uh, during green flag pit stops, a contact uh, coming on the pit road, Kyle Busch and Dale Earnhardt Jr. And that resulted in a commitment cone violation for Earnhardt Jr. and Kevin Harvick, who had to go back up on the racetrack. They have cycled through the pits, uh, but uh, we're not without incident. These pit stops uh, certainly can create problems when you're in a hurry. There's the 41 car, Reed Sorensen. Now, his pit stop was a bit of an adventure. Take a look. Middle of the screen, see the left side of his car. Watch the jack just come shooting out of the left side of the 41 car. Oh, man, that was unbelievable. I mean, that jack was going at such a quick speed. I mean, that could have got one of the crew members. So watch this one more time, guys. This jack just spits out. Whoa! And barely misses the crew guy. I mean, that could have that could have hurt. Yeah, those jacks are light to carry, but boy, when you start pushing them through the air like that. Yeah, they're made out of aluminum, and they're much lighter than a steel jack, but still they're very heavy. Very heavy. After the cycling through of pit stops, uh, 
The 17 is back as the leader. The 24 car and 48 are both on the lead lap. What's going on to the Jeff Gordon pits and Allen? Yeah, they're on the tail end of the lead lap. The leader is behind them on the racetrack because the way the pit rules work. Anytime a yellow comes out in the middle of green flag pit stops, it's confusing, especially for the guy in the cockpit. Where were you on the relative to the start finish when they called for the yellow? That's the 25 pits when they called the yellow. That's four stalls past start finish line. Yeah, what they're doing is they're uh, checking all the tapes, buddy. I think we beat the leader to the outline, and the only reason we lost the lap is because we were on the uh, access road. After you get that all figured out, if they still did, you know, are going to screw us on this deal, then we're going to figure out where we line up, which they got a big mess there. <laughs> well, NASCAR scores the race using electronic loops under the racetrack all around it. They use that electronic scoring to determine where the caution came out, where the pace car goes. That's how these guys are on the tail end of the lead lap, essentially a mile and a half behind the race leader. Thanks, Alan. For more information on crew communications, log on to ESPN.com. Search word communications. Pace car pulling away, and the leader is in the middle of that pack. That is Matt Kenseth. And these cars in front of him are on the tail end of the lead lap in front of him. And they're going to have to hustle to stay there. Green flag waves again here. Lap 57. So Earnhardt Jr. spins around and gets a, a tap again. And he's in the wall here in, in the front straightaway. Jeff Burton got in the back of this eight car. I don't know what happened. Whether maybe Jr. didn't get going good enough. But... Uh, Definitely some contact between the 31 and the 8. Uh, this is unbelievable. A lot of people predicted that Dale Earnhardt Jr. could win this race, and now it's over. A lot of cars are going to get their lap back here because of the way they restarted this race. That will cycle all the guys that were in front of the leader back around behind the leaders, and that will help tremendously. You watch how this field divides now over as you see Earnhardt Jr., the damaged car moving away, and there's the leader, and all the cars in front of him now are going to pull away. There's the opening because the pace car will be able to come out and pick up the leader. Almost half the field is going, to, is going to be able to go around now. See the pace car sitting there waiting on the bottom of the racetrack. He's going to go by that. He will pull up there. That is Brett Bodine who drives the pace car. He'll pull up in front of the 17. That's what a leader right there. So he's going to pull up there, and the rest of these guys are going to be able to. Well, guys, this is a big break for a lot of people, that's for sure. But for Dale Earnhardt Jr., the last race with DEI, not the way he wanted this thing to end up. I cannot believe this has happened. Started all the way at the back of the pack by virtue of a transmission change. It driven the car up into the top 15. Here's the restart. It looked like maybe Dale Jr. had to back off with the guy in front of him. Maybe uh, like a accordion effect right there. Well, right now, guys, take a look at the sun. The sunlight has really hurt a lot of these drivers on the restart. We saw it last night. It took it for a while for that sun to go away. But until then, this is really tough running. Back at Homestead, Miami Speedway, second caution flag of the day. Cars on the back of the lead lap are on pit road. Take a look at who's pitting the 48 of Jimmy Johnson, the 24 of Jeff Gordon. Alan Bestwick. Well, Jeff Gordon's team decided to come down and pit because they think he ran over a piece of debris on the racetrack under the caution flag. That's why they came in. Dave? And Jimmy Johnson's team opted for some fresh tires. The track position was a concern, but they opted to have the fresh rubber instead. Well, Andy, that's just a great move. I mean, there's nothing to lose by doing that. I mean, cycle back around, get yourself, in your state. you're still on the lead lap, top it off the fuel, get some fresh tires, and I think smart move by these guys. When that'll pay off for them is at the end of this run, if it happens to go green again like it did at the beginning of the race, these guys can stay out those few extra laps they need to so they don't put themselves in the same position again. This time of day here at Homestead Miami Speedway, the sun really starts to become a factor. In fact, to see the driver, see this Jeff Burton trying to hold his hand up to be able to shade some of the sun that's coming off of turns one and two. Let's show you how bad the sun is and what you do is we head down to our ESPN Dish Tech Center and Tim Brewer. Thanks, Jerry. The sun's really a problem for the drivers late in the afternoon. You would like to start off with a shield like this, but that's not possible. During the event, what they're gonna do is the sun goes down, they're gonna reach up and take this off. Later in the day, they're gonna take this off so that at the end of the day, they can see the clear vision of the racetrack with a clear shield. Jerry? Thank you, Tim. For more information on visors, log on to ESPN.com. Search word Tech Center 
And you saw that restart a moment ago when these guys are trying to see going into turn one. How much of that visibility actually may have caused that? Well, Jerry, I really believe that's exactly what caused this accident. Because it happened in front of Dale Earnhardt Jr., they started stacking up because they couldn't see. You saw Jeff Burton shading his eyes. And when Jr. got out of the throttle a little bit to give him some room, hey, there was nothing to do, nothing Jeff Burton could have done. So absolutely that's what's happened. Jeff Gordon, the 24 car. Yeah, those guys are back on the lead lap. Gordon being shown in 20th position. Now, you got to make some split-second decisions when the caution comes out or when, you, when you're going to make these pit stops. Let's listen into the radio communications between Jeff Gordon and crew chief Steve Latar. Sure if that fixed that mess or made it work? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you were right, buddy. If we had rolled through, we would have been on the lead lap, but we might have run out of fuel, so I think I made the wrong call there. I, I didn't want to roll through and lose a lap. We wouldn't have any tires or anything. It would really be in trouble, so sorry about that. Back to where we would have been now, so it's all right. For more information on, uh, on uh, crew communications, you can log on to ESPN. As you see, these guys, uh, Jeff. Jeff Gordon, the DuPont Chevrolet. I mean, these guys had no no choice but to make that call. It's always confusing when that caution comes out right in the middle of green flag stops. These guys just made the decision to go ahead and get the tires, and uh, then they'd figure it out from there. All right, let's visit with our in-race reporter, the uh, driver of the car number 99, Carl Edwards, uh, running back in 24th position. Carl Edwards, Rusty, up here in ESPN, you got us? I got you, Rusty. Hey, buddy, looks like that sun on these restarts is really bad down that front straightaway. The eight car just got turned around by the 31 because of it. You having a problem? Well, I was a little upset with the fact that the caution came out earlier and uh, had been thinking about the sun too much, but uh, it looks like it, it, it is kind of bad when we got stuff on the windshield, but uh, you know, hopefully we, we, uh, that goes down soon and we don't get too much more on the windshield. The hardest part was getting to my pit box. I couldn't see a thing. All right, buddy, we're getting ready to go green. I'll get off the radio and we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Rusty. Carl Edwards uh, tightening those belts, pulling down, staying nice and snug in that seat. Most of the crew chiefs and spotters will say, tighten those belts as you get ready to go back to the green flag. By the way, Carl uh, crowned as our NASCAR Bush Series champion just a couple of weeks ago here for 2007. What happens during the race, these guys, these, they'll settle in the seat a little bit, the belts get a little bit loose, and you have to keep tightening them all day long. And uh, that's why we, as crew chiefs, remind these guys to tighten up the seat belts. 62 of 267 laps are complete. Matt Kenseth is our leader. He will lead the field around. We have 28 cars still on the lead lap as the pace car pulls away. Let's listen into our spotters as we go full throttle. Be ready here. Coming to the right. Be ready. Get to the tail. Green, green, green. the move by Matt Kenz at the retake the lead. Bush one of five different leaders we've had here in the first 64 laps. He has now led a total of three laps. Well, Jerry, I tell you what, guard Jeff, Jeff Gordon almost had a close call getting into turn three. They were stacking up in that restart, and right now they're still all stacked up, Andy, but boy, a little while ago it was very, very close. I don't think Gordon's too much worried about this. He's just going to fight his way through it, but the 48 car is behind these guys. He can get caught up in a mess right here. This was a hornet's nest for a little bit. Well, it looks like the 10 car, Patrick Carpentier, is having a lot of problem. Just couldn't get that thing going, and boy, they just really stacked up. The 48 to the inside, the 24, Jeff Gordon the outside. And Patrick Carpanke still having problems out there. 24 car now trying to move on the inside of Paul Menard. Here comes the 48 of Johnson. There's the 16 of Biffle, who's won the last three in a row. Now Johnson looking a little racy in that middle group. Well, this is the point of the race where Johnson's got to be careful. I talked in the countdown show about landmines. He's got to really think that there's landmines all over this track and avoid everything. He gets in his gaggle of cars, and this is where the problem can happen. 
It's a pretty smart team, though. We all know that. Just got to be careful. Well, he's got a fast race car right here. I mean, how conservative can you afford to be? If you try to just say, okay, I'm going to pick my way by slowly, you might get in one of these wrecks. I mean, do you, if you got a fast car, do you just go ahead and push it hard? Do you get past all these guys? Well, Andy, right now, he's dead on a bumper of the 24 cars. There's not much real estate to get around him in right now. So, I mean, this is he's got to be careful when to push 15 cars behind him. Now he's approaching the 66 car. He just got to negotiate himself through all these problems. And this is the point of the race where you could have a problem if you don't exercise extreme patience. This is 18th, 19th, and 20th. This is the 20th place car. Carl Edwards, you're riding along left here. As uh, these guys are just about a half a straightaway behind the leaders. Now we're about an hour away for the sunset here in Miami Homestead Speedway down here that's really going to change a lot and right now it's still sunny the track is still slick we got problem with a lot of glare in the front straightaway you see here and the drivers are negotiating that right now look when that sun goes away boy they get good visibility but that front straightaway is tough here you got a car almost in the wall up there these guys had to dodge it looked like a 19 car yeah, Elliot Sadler. Sadler. he's oh, hit the wall he's crashed yeah he's got a lot of damage still green no caution flag as of yet as Sandler gets the car down on the inside. And we saw last night. Four guys, be ready here. Now I'm coming to you, I just tore it up. Right rear damage, probably right side flat, right rear flat. Maybe. 12 car left side of your screen, Ryan Newman up in front of the 42 of Juan Pablo Montoya. Close racing everywhere. By the way, Montoya back there in front of his teammate, David Strimmy. And it gets crowded at this racetrack in a hurry when you're trying to pass and guys in the middle of the room slipping and sliding up and uh, sometimes not a lot of room on the outside. There's Bush, the leader, Kansas in second going by. Then comes Newman and Montoya in third and fourth. Like NASCAR's black flag in the eight car. Got a rear panel flapping in the breeze. Mike Massaro. You know, guys, I had a conversation with Juan Pablo Montoya's crew chief, Donnie Wingo, this morning, and the topic that really kept coming up was how much he has improved over the course of this rookie season. And Donnie told me that in the area where he improved the most is driving a loose race car. He's gotten a lot better at that. In fact, he had a big turnaround just a few weeks ago during the Atlanta COT test. They intentionally set that car up very loose, trying to challenge Juan Pablo Montoya to learn how to drive that race car. At one point, they, they actually asked him if they wanted to tighten it up and make him a little bit more comfortable. Juan Pablo's answer to that was, no, I need to learn how to do this. And he forced himself throughout the day to learn that handling condition. That may be paying off here today. Made his debut here at this racetrack a year ago, Mike, and finished 34th after uh, being involved in an incident and smacking the wall hard in turn one. And boy, what a difference a year makes for Juan Pablo Montoya. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC station. ESPN's coverage of NASCAR Nexto Cup Series Ford 400 on ABC. Brought to you by Allstate, the official insurance sponsor of NASCAR. Gillette Fusion Power, the best shave ever. And Napa Auto Parts. Napa, get the good stuff. Sun setting here in South Florida at Homestead Miami Speedway. We are under caution for the third time today. That's the car number there, 15 of Paul Menard, the rookie driver, spinning it around as they have brought the car on the pit road to try to bend some of that sheet metal away. And let's take a look and see the, the view that uh, Ricky Rudd had of what happened to Menard. Oh, Andy, it looks like that top three. He just got a little too high, got off from underneath him. I didn't see anybody touch him. Just flat spun that car out. That yeah, thing just snapped around on Paul. Bangs the left side into the wall pretty good. They're going to have to fix some of that damage. Probably have some suspension damage. Here comes the leaders. Here they will come down uh, 45 miles an hour. Second major pit stop of the day. Jeff Gordon's bunch is there. Jimmy Johnson's bunch are ready. We head down the pit road and Jamie Little. And Robbie Reiser, crew chief for, for Matt Kenseth, reminding him Come down to your pit box slow. We're going to do four tires. We're not going to make any changes. And Matt said, you guys need to direct me. I cannot see my pit box. The sun is a big problem right now. Alan? And Jeff Gordon, center box left screen is pitting. He says that the car is better on the entry to the corner, but still the nose sliding a little too much off the corner. So they're going to try and make an adjustment here. It'll be a four-tire change for the 24 car. David? 
and the 48 thinks they might go for two, Allen, but they're going to stay with four up here on the 48. No changes except for a little air pressure to try to free him up a little bit more. The 24 does take two. The 48 will take the left sides as well. Jack going up at this point, and Jimmy going up at row. Jimmy saying, the car is doing what I want it to do. I hope my times are good. Uh, the one on pit road there wasn't necessarily their best, guys. Yeah, it looked like they had some problems on that pit stop. and lost a few spots. Lost a lot of spots, actually. And you see Jeff Gordon, by the virtue of those two tire stops, gaining 10 positions, so that will put him up. And 48, Jimmy Johnson back where he does not want to be in a crowd of cars toward the back of the pack on a restart. We'll come back with a green flag at Homestead, Miami, in a moment. Final race in the chase in 187 laps. The next Dell Cup champ will be crowned. Story in the FedEx race rundown. Points leader Jimmy Johnson started the day on the pole. The first lap picked up five bonus points. So now all he has to do is finish 19th to win it all. And the battle we're keeping an eye on. Jeff Gordon with an early pass on Johnson. Jeff Gordon marching towards the front. Jimmy Johnson did what he did. had to do early getting those five bonus points. Now he's just out trying to maintain position. Jeff, Jeff Gordon is coming up. The last race for Dale Earnhardt Jr. in number eight for DEI. And he found trouble early. Boy, just the season for Dale Earnhardt Jr. cannot end quick enough, and uh, this is just like the rest of the season. He's had a lot of bad luck today. Right now, the 48 and the 24 separated by just 47 points. We're keeping an eye on it, Doc. Indeed, Susie, in the 24 car, Jeff Gordon will line up third in the restart. And how important is it for Jeff Gordon to be able to get a lap led? Remember, Jimmy Johnson has led a lap here already to get those five bonus points. And Rusty Jeff Gordon, he's got to get by Blaney and Hamlin and somehow charge up there and lead the lap. But, Jerry, I think this was a good move, putting right sides on Jeff Gordon to see what it's going to do. He needed the track position. And track position, Andy, this racetrack assists everything in the world. Anywhere you're at a high-speed racetrack where air is important, track position is just key. He can lead the lap. He'll cut it to 42 points. We'll see what he can do. Hamlin pulls away, leads him down with the green flag. Lap 81 of 267. Jimmy Johnson mired back in 14th position back there behind Mark Martin and in front of Carl Levers. A gaggle of cars. There's the glare. You're looking back. At Denny Hamlin from Jeff Burton's onboard camera. Jeff Burton's now back on the lead lap after all his problems. He's worked his way back now. He's not just a lucky dog. He's on the lead lap in front of this lever. Here comes Denny Hamlin. He's challenging him back for this lap. Well, how about Matt Kenseth? He's gone by Gordon to try to move his way to the front. Here comes Kenseth on the high side in the 17 car. Well, it appears right now the two right side tires for Gordon aren't coming in very good at the moment. Although, before we judge it, let's let him run some more laps and see if that car settles in because that's generally what happens to right side tires. Rolling the dice for Gordon. Two tire changes for the second time, and he's trying to hold his position. Here comes Truex, who's been awfully good on the bottom to take that spot away. Boy, I just saw the 24 just wiggle in the back of that car up off of turn four. It means it's a little loose right now on those two right side tires, and the rest of these guys got four tires. They're just driving off at the moment, so this might not be paying off. Again, let's watch this a little longer, though. Tells and me that Jeff Gordon driving that car extremely hard right now, too. You can see how he's sawing that wheel. And we heard him complaining how the nose of the car has been sliding up across the racetrack. He was lacking so much grip just like that. The one car just slipped up across the racetrack. I think he went up there to see how the grip level was up there because he's been running there the whole time. And what they do is they run these you know, the laps on the bottom with the good tires, and then they'll move up. But I think Mark Truex just says, hey, my crew's up top. I'm going to go up here and run. Now, he's not even messing around with the bottom. I mean, he just threw that bottom away, went right to that top again, and he's just comfortable up there. Like he was headed to Key Largo. He just turned right going into turn one there, went way up across the racetrack. Now he's trying to race back by the 24 car and make that high groove work. Well, he was going the right direction, Jerry, if he wanted to go to Key Largo <laughs> off of turn two, <laughs> heading south and getting on down there. A lot of good teams have stayed down there this week. Had a good time down there. Kurt Busch in the two car coming into the picture there on the left side of your screen. Jimmy Johnson in the 48 car on the right side. Johnson still back in 13th position. Clint Boyer behind him. A gaggle of cars around the 48. Now take a look at Juan Pablo Montoya in the bottom of the racetrack on the left-hand side of your screen, folks. This car has been fast all day long. No fluke going on there. But the guy in front of him, Kurt Busch, this member, this car has been fast also. Won a lot of races this year that two car has. Guess who's back up front? The 17 car of Kenza trying to get back there. Denny Hamlin trying to stay there. 
Again, the 31 car, Jeff Burton now on the tail end of the lead lap. Boy, does he need a caution flag in a hurry to be able to come back around and get his car dialed in, not get past with these guys and put a lap down. See how Matt Kenseth is using that bottom lane right now. Like I said, the tires are very, very grippy. He can run down there, make time. But as the tires wear, you'll see even the 17 car go way up top like you saw with one car true up. More on Matt Kent as we check in with Jamie Little. Well, Doc, you know, we've been talking a lot about this being the final race for the traditional car. Well, Matt Kent has brought his favorite car. It's two years old. He's raced it a ton of times. It has multiple wins under it. He loves this car, and tonight it's the same. He's loving it. He thinks he can bring it home to victory. After all, it's been since February since he won a race. And as I mentioned earlier, this is his final race with Robbie Reiser as his crew chief, and they would want nothing more than to go to victory lane and then, of course, retire the traditional car. You're exactly right, Jamie. They would love to get Robbie Reiser a great send-off in victory lane here as he becomes the general manager of Roush Fenway Racing. You see the left side of your screen, Kenseth goes by and puts Jeff Burton, his uh, buddy, a lap down. They were former teammates at Roush Racing years ago. Right side of your screen, you see Jeff Borden uh, still running the bottom of the racetrack, trying to hang tough with the 42 car and the 20 Montoya and Stewart just go sailing by. These two tires are not working for the 24. They, you know, it, was a, it was a good gamble, but it's just not working for him right now. No, it's definitely a great idea to go for track position because they had no idea what the car was going to do on two. So uh, they just had to try and go for it. Alan? And Rusty, just remember, this is the second consecutive stop. They just took the right side tires on the stop at lap 60. They just took rights. Then on the stop at lap 78, they just took rights. Steve Latar trying to get himself some track position and get his car toward the front. Right now, though, they're just kind of mired back in the traffic. He'll have to play a few more games, I would assume, a little bit later on if he's going to try and extend any kind of advantage over the 48 car. So Andy, Steve Latar rolling the dice not once but twice on right side tire. Well, he's in the position of gambling. He doesn't. It's not going to hurt him if uh, if they you know if they don't get a good result out of this. They they do have a lot to gain by gambling, and that's why you see them doing this. But the first time they did the two tire deal, they didn't have but about four or five laps on the left side. So I kind of I knew that, and I'm watching. But it really was kind of you know really not hard. It's not easy to gauge it from that. But yeah. this run, they had quite a few laps on the left, and it's not working. Well, you're exactly right with what you just said. I mean, this guy has nothing to lose right now. He's got second place in the points locked up. And if he's going to try something, he needs to try it early right now so it works at the end. How much of a gamble was it for Jimmy Johnson's guys to take four and get him back in this mess, back about 15th in the middle of the pack? I would have been a little concerned about that as well, but he seems to be uh, clearing some of the traffic there or trying to get by the 0-1 of Mark Martin. Well, you see Jeff Gordon losing spots right here. It's, it's easier to have good tires and be on offense and pass cars than it is to be uh, getting past like you see the 24. And I, I think for Chad Knauss, he made the right move putting four tires on this car. Jeff Gordon, left side of your screen, moving back. Jimmy Johnson, right side of your screen, starting to move forward. 91 of 267 laps are in the books right now. Jeff Gordon is 75 points back of the 48 car. You're watching ESPN on ABC. I can't stop, it's all I know. The biggest music stars on the planet come together with live performances by Rascal Flatts, Maroon 5, Lenny Kravitz, Fergie, Rihanna, and more. For the first time ever, your votes will decide who wins. Hosted by Jimmy Kimmel and broadcast live from the Nokia Theater LA, the American Music Awards live tonight following the race right here on ABC. Take a look at our forward lap leaders uh, thus far today. 97 laps in the books, and Matt Kenseth has led three times for 65 laps. Kurt Busch has led twice for 17. You see Newman, Hamlin, Kyle Busch, and Jimmy Johnson has led a lap, and that's uh, significant because that's five extra bonus points. One of our lap leaders, the two car of Kurt Busch, uh, could be uh, having an issue. There's a 17 car of Kenseth. Newman is second, by the way. Denny Hamlin back in third. Here comes the two car of Kurt Busch. I don't know which one's vibrating, but we need to get a real tight. I bet we know which one it is. Yeah, I believe it's the left rear. We saw in that last pit stop. It looks like they were struggling back there. I would bet they got a left rear problem. Allen. Well, Rusty, when they went to attach the lugs onto the left rear on the last pit stop, the socket hung on one of the lugs, and they had to pound on the wrench to get it off that socket. Perhaps that's what happened, but Kurt Busch very frustrated, obviously.
obviously vibration on the car. This team has run fast this year, but they've had a number of problems, a couple of them on pit road, a couple of them just the handling going away late in the race that have taken them away from wins. When I talked with Kurt this morning, he said, boy, those last 50 laps of these races have gotten us. They'll change all four here, but that's going to put a guy who was leading earlier in the race way behind. You always want to get four tires when you got that vibration. We've seen that bike quite a few guys this year. But we had a pretty good idea that this might have been the left rear tire that was loose on this car. See, on this last stop, this is not the last stop we just saw, but on the last caution flag stop, these guys are in here changing this left side tire. You can see they're struggling with the bridge. And the car leaves actually before he, the left rear tire uh, changer was finished. Checkers. They're, they're definitely going to find some oblong holes in this wheel where it was run loose. And it looks though there's the problem right there. The wheels are all oblong. The left rear obviously was left loose, and you saw it when the fella had the lug nut jammed up in the wheel. Crew chief Pat Trison couldn't see that. Jack dropped, the car went off. You know, and Andy as a crew chief, if you could have solved that problem, maybe you could have screamed for him to stop and fix that. Well, it, it, you're going to lose a lot of track position to bring him back in, but the uh, tire changer should have known that also. Just say, hey, bring him back in, let's get it tight. Still early enough, we can get it back. You don't want to have to pit under green like that. I remember last year, though, right here on the, this racetrack, going out of pit road, the same problem happened to Jimmy Johnson, and Jimmy Johnson had to stop and fix the car. He dodged the bullet a year ago. He dodged a couple of bullets at this racetrack a year ago, but here, Jimmy Johnson, November 2006, a big piece of debris goes through the front air dam early in the race. He had to come back and put a patch on it. Here's the pit stop you're talking about, Rusty. On pit road, getting ready to leave and checking out. Says, whoa, 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 we got lug nuts missing. Great call by the crew chief, Andy, to stop him and put those lug nuts yeah, on. Yeah, that's definitely how you do it right, right there. I, I got to really hand it to Chad on that one because that's hard to do is get that car to stop and just go ahead and bite the bullet and fix what you got wrong. Now he would go on and win the championship, folks. But just remember now, had he lost a lap last year, he would have finished no better than 21st here, and it would have been very close. So a critical call with a guy on the right side of your screen. What a leader Chad Canal says. Jerry, to Pat Trice's defense, though, with Kurt Busch's team, there were so many people around that left rear tire. When that tire changer jumped back and that jack fell, that's always the key for the driver to go. And Pat just probably couldn't get a good look at that. I'll give you that about, about Pat Trice, but that left rear tire changer, he knows that wheel's loose. I've changed plenty of those tires, and you know if you've got them tight or not. Well, there's very few of the tire changers say everything's fine. <laughs> In their mind, they want it to be tight, and sometimes it makes it. A lot of times it doesn't. If you see that now when I'm watching the video, what do you go to the left rear tire changer? What do you say to it? Well, there's not much you can say right now. You just got to make sure you hit all the lug nuts, be very, very deliberate, and make sure the wheels are tight from here on. That's all you can say. There's nothing you, you can't really get on him right now. You wait till Monday morning and talk about Maybe it. Maybe you just plant the seed if you're unsure. Come tell me. Thanks. Exactly. If we get a vibration, we might, we might have an idea. Man, Ken's at the leader here. Has led three times for 73 laps. How about Tony Stewart, the two-time winner here at Homestead Miami Speedway? Tony, he set sail very early, started back in 14th spot, now being shown in second position. There's Tony in the 20 car, driving for Joe Gibbs, the coach. And two boy, talking about the 20 car, I mean, he is about a tenth of a second faster than the leader at Kenseth right now. Ryan Newman, we talked about that 80 race winless streak. Boy, would he love to go to victory lane uh, in this finale for 2007. Back and forth. Denny Hamlin, one of our chasers, who struggled a little bit in the chase here down the stretch, but uh, having a good run here today now being shown in the fourth position. The other Joe Gibbs car, by the way. Then comes the fifth place car, the one of Martin Truex Jr. Truex, uh, this is the car he set on the pole with in Texas, nearly won at Atlanta. In fifth spot, behind him, leading rookie of the year contender, Juan Pablo Montoya in the 42, the one-year anniversary of his very first NASCAR Nextel Cup start here at Homestead Miami Speedway. More than one car, but look at the right front fender, and it looks like it's got some damage on it right now. It's not slowing the car down much, but he must have got himself in an incident somewhere or something. Doesn't look right on that corner. Yeah, I see that. I saw that earlier when we showed that. It could be some of the repair that they made on that car from the practice crash. They use a lot of these uh, decals and wraps and whatnot to, to kind of repair that damage, and it looks like some of that's blowing off. So it may not have been recent damage. Yeah, he brushed the wall in the first of two practice sessions here on Saturday. They had to go in and repair the car, but it had to slow it down too much because he's already led here today. Matt Kenza, four consecutive top five finishes. He didn't get the win. He's just trying to do it here today. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations.
Welcome back to the Ford 400 season finale. Homestead Miami Speedway here for the NASCAR Nextel Cup drivers. Aerial coverage from high above Homestead Miami, courtesy of our good friends at Goodyear. The official tire of NASCAR helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for over 50 years. Four memorable moments from the 2007 season. Let's look back just a little bit. You remember these folks? How about the confrontation in turn one at Watkins Glen, Kevin Harvick and Juan Pablo Montoya? A disagreement. How about the opening race of the year, the final lap at Daytona, two one hundredths of a second, and Kevin Harvick would win the Daytona 500 over Mark Martin. How special was that? Jimmy Johnson becomes the first driver since 1998 to win four consecutive Nextel Cup events. And another moment, how about a son, a famous son, having to walk away from the company his dad began. He hooks up with Hendrick Motorsports, Dale Earnhardt Jr., leaving DEI. And folks, you can vote on which of those most memorable moments uh, you think is the best. That's our AT&T Crew Chief Challenge. Is it A, the fight, B, the Daytona 500, C, Jimmy Johnson, four straight, or D, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s move? Text the word CREW to 191 on your wireless phone and send in your answer. The results will be shown later in the race. Making a Johnson and Gordon together again. That could be a pretty good country song here. 24 and 48. Jeff Gordon in eighth position. Jimmy Johnson back in ninth. The same thing we've seen all year long, guys. They just can't seem to get away from each other. And right now, Jeff Gordon needed to have extreme speed in this race just to blow the doors off that 48 and drive away from him. And he doesn't have it this race. I think he's going to have some speed when he gets four tires back on this car. I think that's what he's struggling with right now. Jeff Gordon in this 24. As soon as they get back in the pits and get four, he'll be back in the game. Hey, Burns. Yeah, and Andy, I think that's probably the biggest difference right now. Remember, the 48 did take those four tires. That is coming to him. The car's been good all weekend. On lap 99, Jimmy reporting, I think we're getting good when asked what the car was doing right now. So, thinks he's getting good. Maybe just a tick on the free side, but not real bad right now. Alan? On lap 116, just a couple of circuits ago, Jeff Gordon reporting that his car is lacking front end grip there. Right through to the center of the corner. Now that, in addition to lacking that... Lap 118, 267, Kenzuk, Stewart, holding one, two. Getting set for pit stops moving in here as the 48-24. And as you said, Andy Petrie, that 24, they want to come in and get four fresh good years on Jeff Gordon's Chevy. Back with pit stops and more in a moment. And we welcome you back to the Ford 400. You saw the number 17 car, the number one Green Bay Packer fan on the NASCAR circuit. Matt Kenseth continues to lead. But the man who's stocking him right there in the 20 cars, a story as we start to look ahead to next year, consider, folks, this is the last day that you're going to see Tony Stewart driving a Chevy. That's right. Next year, the Gibbs team will make that switch to Toyota. And I wonder how all his fans will accept that. Tony very loose prior to the start of this race. He felt he was going to have a good run. The fellas upstairs have been telling you he's got one of the fastest cars. It's been a disappointing chase overall. But smoke has pulled up into the number four spot right now as we send you back on town, Dr. Jerry Punch. And uh, Dr. Punch, uh, Jimmy and uh, Jeff, they're kind of keeping their eyes on each other, aren't they, partner? They are teammates. They're staying close on the racetrack as well as in the point standings. Brent. Here's a 29 car, Kevin Harvick on pit road. Let's go down to Mott. And they've been struggling with that car all day long, Doc. At times it's been tight, at other times it's been loose, all in the course of the same run. This time they'll make a chassis adjustment, wedge, four tires and fuel. Andy, looks like that car has been run a little bit tight. I saw him on the right rear jack will go down on it, which is an indication they're loosening the car up, trying to make the front end turn better on it. Trying to keep up with this changing track. Probably cooled down about 10 degrees now, and these guys are having to screw on these jack screws to try to keep up with it. Boy, right now, the sun is just about completely gone here. This track's going through a big change right now, and it's continuing to change at this moment. It's not dead dark yet, and when it gets completely pitch black out here, that's when it's going to be completely different, but right now, it's getting tighter. Car number one of Martin Truex Jr. He is in second position, being shown about five seconds behind Kenza. There's a 17 car of Matt Kenseth. You see the interval going by. There's a Jeff Burton, the lap car. There is the one car who's in second spot. We're going to see all these guys on pit road here in just about three or four laps. 
And it looks like that debris that was on the right front corner, Martin Truex has actually blew off the car, so it's back to looking normal. I guess that was a decal that was on there, actually. You know, it doesn't look normal. I saw the uh, brake rotor glowing, getting in the corner. You usually don't see that on a mile and a half racetrack. But I saw the brakes glowing red while he was getting into turn. Yeah, that's pretty unusual. So they're really sailing these cars down in a corner and using a lot of brake to slow them down. And that's something you don't see early in the run or in qualifying, things like that. But as the tires wear, they got to slow these cars down just a little bit more. Guys up on the wall getting ready for their next pit stop. Well, we just uh, a handful of laps away from the halfway point. Here is Matt Kenseth on pit road. He's coming off five consecutive top five finishes. Trying to get a win here right behind him. The seven car of Robbie Gordon as we go down to Jamie Little. I'll tell you what, they've made very few changes on this 17 machine. He says he's a little free getting in and a little tight, but he said just leave it. Don't make any adjustments. I'm happy with the way the car is. Obviously, he's been dominating this race. Four tires, no changes, like I said. Full fuel for Matt Kenson. The one car of Martin Truex is on pit road. They made a two-tire stop the last time down pit road. Definitely four this time for the one car. Running very well. No wrenches going in the back window. So it'll be air pressure adjustments only for Martin Truex. Loose early. Then the car came to him during the run. The 12 car of Jimmy Johnson in. Championship leader right now padding his points lead over his teammate Jeff Gordon. The car is a little loose late off the corner. Four tire change and an air pressure adjustment. Alan. Well, Jeff Gordon came on his radio just a little while ago discussing his car's handling after that condition I told you about said, you know, if we get four tires, I think we'll be okay. Well, he just cut him now and got out ahead of Jimmy Johnson, Jamie. And Tony Seward has the same complaint a lot of these teams have. He said he's just a little free in the beginning, but as that sun sets, it's cooling down. The car is coming to him. That uh, pit crew trying to redeem themselves after some bad pit stops last weekend. It's a good stop for Tony Seward. Dave? And Ryan Newman is in that car real tight, according to the driver. They've already been on the right side. They finish up on the left side and send him down pit road. Mark Martin also on pit road in front of him. It stops the order of the day. We are three laps away from halfway. And Juan Pablo Montoya in front of Mike Massaro. And Doc, they're going to make an air pressure adjustment on the 42 car. The only thing that Juan was really concerned with, he wanted to know if any fast cars were running the bottom groove. He was told no. He was considering running that groove. He obviously went against that. Meanwhile, the 26 car headed down pit road as well. Jamie McMurray making a stop, a four-tire change. No major adjustments, just air pressure to that machine. Here's Casey Mears, a 25 car, who was being shown as the leader. Remember, he will move to the five car next year with Alan Gustafson as a crew chief, still as a part of Hendrick Motorsports. Coming down for his pit stop on lap 132 at 45 miles an hour. They are cycling through this second section of major pit stops for everyone under the green flag. He heads down to Alan Bestwick. Yeah, it takes a long time to get there at that pit road speed limit, doesn't it, Doc? Four tire change coming up here for Casey Mears. We talked about this being the last race for that number 25 for Hendrick Motorsports. Casey's car, he feels like the, the adjustments they made on the last pit stop help. They're going to go a little more on this pit stop as they work toward the nighttime hours and this track continues to cool. Mike? And Reed Sorensen looking for a clean pit stop. Remember last time, the Jackman hit the deck. This time, clean, though. He's away. Pit stops continuing. You see Reed Sorensen exiting the 17 car, now cycling back as a leader. Now, this is the Roush Fenway car. We told you the guy who's won the last three in a row here, a Roush Fenway car, and that was Greg Biffle. And we had Greg Biffle as our guest there during our qualifying show in the pit studio on Friday. And he said, when the track gets cool and the sun goes down, our cars get really, really good for us, for us to change significantly when it starts to get dark. Got Juan Pablo Montoya just made his pit stop. You see his crew cam right here from the from uh, Chip Good. He's the rear tire carrier. He carries the tire out here for this rear tire changer. You see all the action, how quick these guys have to move. Has to get that tire back to the pit wall. Grab this new tire for the left rear. Stick this thing on here, and he's got to stick it right on the studs for this tire changer so he can hit all five nuts and drive off. Chip, a former go-kart racer, loves to, uh, loves to be able to go over the wall there and change tires for the Ganassi Sabatas team for Juan Pablo Montoya. A couple of open wheelers there on the screen. Patrick Carpentier in the 10 car. He'll run full-time in 2008. His second consecutive start here at the end of the year in that 10 car. 
going up high, the 17 car of Matt Kenseth. He is the leader. The one of Martin Truex is in second position. Kurt Busch, the two car. Back in third, remember Bush had the unscheduled stop for the vibration. Back on lap 100. Just past the halfway point at Homestead, Miami. Back with more in a moment. This telecast is available on ABC HD, presented by DLP HD TV. Monday Night Football on ESPN continues tomorrow in the thin air of Invisco Field at mile high as Vince Young leads the Tennessee Titans in a battle against Jay Cutler and the Denver Broncos. Monday Night Football on ESPN, 8.30 Eastern Time. Coverage begins at 7 Eastern with Monday Night Countdown. Mike Jaws, Tony, Michelle, and our own Susie Coleman will be there out in Denver. Should be a good one coming up on Monday night. Take a look at our Ford lap leaders. Matt Kenseth has led four times for 108 laps. Kurt Busch has led 17 laps. You see Ryan Newman there has led eight. Denny Hamlin. And remember now, Jimmy Johnson has led a lap, so he's gotten the extra five bonus points. As uh, we take you up to speed with our lead drivers, starting with Matt Kenseth and Jamie Little. Well, Doc, what a difference this race has turned out to be for Matt Kenseth. This is eighth start, and it's the first time he has ever led here. And you mentioned Greg Bipple talking about how good these Roush Fenway Fords come to life when the sun goes down. Well, that's certainly the case for the 17. He's turning up the wick, and that's bad news for the rest of the field. Mike? It's been kind of a rough summer for Denny Hamlin. In fact, he only has three top 10 finishes in his last 12 races. Tonight, though, a completely different story. He describes his car as, quote, awesome. Just minimal changes on that car. A couple of air pressure adjustments. That's about it. Dave? And confirming what Andy was looking at earlier, Doc, as well, that right front damage on the one car, that is a decal coming off. The reason he got the front damaged in that practice crash, he kind of whipped it around. Back end hit, front end whipped around. They think it's okay, though. Four tire stop and going good, Jamie. Well, Tony Stewart, two-time winner here. He's never won on this new Bates configuration. He feels like he maybe had the car to win here tonight, but his best finish the last nine races, third. Dave? The 12th car this year, well, the performance has been there, according to crew chief Mike Nelson. They've been really proud of that. Trying to finish off the year strong. He's been close a few times. Today, a tight race car that they need to keep adjusting on, Jamie. And hats off to Dave Blaney. He has been in the top 10 this entire race. It's all about securing the top 35 the points. He sits 35th right now. He's looking at Daytona once a guaranteed spot for he, Bill Davis, and Toyota. Alan? If the caution were to come out in the next two laps, it would be a huge break for Kurt Busch. Remember, he had to pit under the green at lap 99 for the vibration. He right now is cycled back around, and if the yellow came out, all the other leaders would stop, but Kurt's two laps away from pitting, and that's going to put him back a lap down. Jeff Gordon is in seventh place now. Gordon's just going around Kurt Busch. Gordon feeling the four tires have helped his car. His team saying they really can't do anything and take any silly chances right now because anything could happen with the 48 until later in the race. They've got to still play slightly conservative as well. Mike? Juan, Juan Pablo Montoya in searching mode right now, searching for the right line on the racetrack. Says he's good on the bottom, just not fast enough. Still trying to find the place where his car reaches optimum performance. He's saying the car gets looser as the run goes on. Dave? Johnson looking for an edge today, but doesn't want his car to be edgy, and it is a little bit right now in turns one and two. Edgy, according to the driver, after that last pit stop, they did make an adjustment, Mike. Carl Edwards still looking for just a little bit more. It's uh, not quite perfect. He's looking for a wedge adjustment next time in. The command from his crew chief, Bob Osborne, is three-pronged. Be smooth, be patient, and watch out for the rookie, Patrick Carpentier. He says he's running just a little bit too hard right now. Wants Carl to be very aware of that. Dave? Well, Mark Martin finishing out the year in the 0-1 car. It's been a good year for him. Highlights include almost winning the Daytona 500, driving a Bush car for Rick Hendrick, and doing what he can for this DEI team as now Ryan Newman has spun in turns three and four, guys. And boy, that's good news for Kurt Busch. That's exactly what Busch needed, and it happened by his own teammate. Man, that was just unbelievable, Andy. When you, you never think your teammate's going to spin and help you out. Ryan Newman spinning here, bringing out caution number four on the day, lap 148, and uh, probably mixed emotions right now for Roger Penske. They wanted to caution for the two car, but not to have the 12 car bring it out, his other cars. Newman now uh, will bring the car around and try to get uh, service done on his Dodge. Looks like he's just got a little damage to the front end of the car on the bottom side there. If they can get that fixed, I think it'll be okay. 
Yeah, the lower air dam is very important on these cars. It's all tucked under a couple right. inches, so. He's got a little damage on the right rear corner. That kid can add something in the front of that, Andy. Beat that left front fender out. Should be okay. Let me show you what happened here. Right in front of the 24 car of Jeff Gordon. Tony Stewart is there. Watch Gordon go get by. Ryan Newman kept the car somehow and, uh, from going up across the racetrack. Stewart got by, as did the two car of Kurt Busch. And here's Jeff Gordon just minding his own business, passing the 20 car. It's like, whoa. Somebody parked in the middle of the racetrack. Yeah, he got stopped pretty good, and so did Tony Stewart. He really wowed that number 20 car down big time. Well, let's go down to Jamie Little as the 17 car is going to be headed to you for his pit stop. Jamie? Well, some bad news for our leader, Matt Kenseth. He just came over the radio and said, guys, I've lost my primary battery and I have no brake fluid. This is going to make things really difficult tonight. Remember, this happened to him in Dover and it cost him the entire race. Four tires, no changes. Let's go to Allen. Jeff Gordon, center frame, said, I am having a lot of trouble passing, guys. His crew chief, Steve Letard, said, your lap times look good. We just need to get up there and race with him. It's going to be a four-tire change for the 24. Jankenhaus asking his driver, is it really loose or just a little bit? Let's do a little something, says Jimmy Johnson. That'll be a wedge bar, that'll be a wedge adjustment in the left rear. Air pressure on the right rear. As they come to the left side now, the 24 is going to win that race off of pit road this time. Clint Boyer gains 10 spots. You see uh, Tony Stewart minus five. Kenza will remain the leader, but boy, that battery issue's got to be worrisome in the 17 pit. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Back at Homestead Miami Speedway, working caution for the fourth time in our season finale, the Ford 400 the NASCAR Nextel Cup Series season. Now, earlier we showed you four memorable moments from the 2007 season in our at t Crew Chief Challenge. We asked you to vote on the, your most memorable moment. You guys, what do you think? What's your vote? Oh, man, I'm going for the fight. Not I like me, man. I'm going with Junior. I'm sticking with my man right there. I'll bet it's Junior. I All think right, that they 500 finish Bingo. was pretty good there. Oh. But <laughs> yeah, you guys weren't even close. Ah, oh, you blew my doors <laughs> off on that one. <laughs> Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s announced with the league D. Uh, there is... Uh, you know, Sister Kelly, Rick Hendrick, uh, making an announcement in 2008. He will be a part of Hendrick Motorsports driving the 88 car. And I'm already hearing from that camp that they are pumped up about how they're going to come out of the box in 2008. Okay, Carl Evers is trying to get some of this tape off the windshield. That sun's gone down, so he doesn't need that up there to shield it. So he's pulling it all off. It's all on the inside, and it's got a tab on it that he can grab a hold of. Now you can see the whole track. Those are not unapproved adjustments. No, those are approved. That's the only thing we let the driver adjust on, though. <laughs> All right. Pace car pulls away here. 115 laps to go. Remember the 17 car you heard Jamie say? Possible battery problem, possible problem with brake fluid. How much is that on the mind of the guys on pit road, and how about the guy in the seat of that 17 car? Boy, he shot out of as a cannon right there. Yeah, as he drives away, he's got all these problems. <laughs> he's been good all night long. But I'm really interested in seeing this because this track has changed so much how it's going to affect these cars right now. We saw last night in the Bush Series race that it changed a lot. The guys that weren't running good in the beginning started running good later on. But Matt Kenseth has run well from the green flag. Dropped the green, he was out front. Kevin Harvick trying to make a move on the inside of David Strimmy. Harvick in the 29 car. By the way, Harvick's teammate, the 07, Clint Boyer, going by there, only took a two-tire change. That's why he gained so many spots on that exchange on pit road. Well, if I'm Jimmy Johnson, I've looked at too many cars in my windshield today, man. He's been in the middle of this pack almost all day. Here he is, three wide coming off the corner down the straightaway. It makes you wonder. A guy's been dominant all year long. He's won four in a row, and he's here at the championship week, and he's mired back in all these cars. Doesn't make much sense, but I kind of feel they know what they're doing. What worries me is there's only one car in the garage area, still 42 cars running. So if you have an issue, you can still finish 42nd. Well, that's, uh, huh. that's what gives these crew chiefs ulcers sitting on that pit box, man. You know, that's a bad feeling when nobody's falling out. They're all there, and even the eight car, Dale Earnhardt Jr., is still on the racetrack and running pretty fast. Chad Canals, he's watching this, and he, he's probably a lot more nervous than Jimmy. Jimmy can use up all that nervous energy driving the car. Chad's got to watch this. Special day here for a lot of drivers and talking about farewells. How about Ricky Rudd in the 88 car? Ricky Rudd 
making his 906th and final career start. His illustrious 32-year career that began back in March of 1975. He'll walk away when this race is over, when the checkered flag weighs 29 poles, 23 career wins, and uh, what a career for Ricky Rudd. Uh, and he says goodbye to NASCAR next L Cup. What a great career. And his car owner, Robert Yates, this is his last race as an active car owner, too. And this is somebody that the whole racing community here is going to miss a lot. And he's done a lot in the sport. NASCAR president Mike Helton mentioned Robert Yates in the driver's meeting this morning. And the driver stood and gave Robert Yates a standing ovation. That's how much they appreciate and admire and respect Robert Yates for what he's done for the sport. Oh, he's one of the best engine builders and car owners in the country. I mean, every time you go to Daytona or some of the bigger tracks, you fear that Yates engines. You go, oh, my gosh, what's Robert got up a sleeve this time? A lot of fast cars here. How about Gordon? Do you get in there? You're running for a championship. Whoa, trouble on the racetrack. Another car sliding. Oh, a couple of cars. It's a Toyota and a Chevrolet. Johnny Sauter. It took I'll these guys a while. Up. Sorry. I watched these guys about 20 laps ago racing real hard with each other and took them a few laps to finally get it done. You heard Johnny Sauter. See, I just yeah. lost I just it. I'm sorry. These, these guys were racing hard, sorry. man. The other car involved is the 83 of Brian Vickers, one of the Red Bull Toyotas, bringing out caution for the fifth time today. That's too bad. It looks like that 70's got a lot of damage in the front. 10 was involved. Patrick Carpentier, one of the Gillette Everham cars, as he is on pit road. What Patrick Carpentier's had a tough week so far. Crashed last night in the Boost Series race also. Well, it looks like Johnny just got loose. And hits that wall hard, boy. Boy, right at the end of that pit wall, too. It just tears the front end all the heck on that car. You see Vickers come in here. He just piles in behind. He, that was way late Vickers getting in. There. Makes you think, yeah, uh, here we go. Yeah, I was going to say it must have been a chain reaction thing because that was a late spin by the 83. Yeah, and as a driver, Andy, you see all this smoke coming, and when the smoke's coming, you start checking up, and it causes these chain reactions, and that's what happened there. Johnny Sauter climbing out of the 70 car for the final time. Scott Riggs will move over to that team in 2008. Frustration for Sauter, who's had a pretty good year in that 70 machine. Back in a moment. ESPN's coverage of NASCAR Nextel Cup Series Ford 400 on ABC. Brought to you by Pennzoil Platinum, full synthetic motor oil with adaptive molecules. Aflac. Want to meet Carl Edwards and the Aflac Duck? Visit AfflacRacing.com for more details. Coca-Cola. Thanks for drinking. And Subway. Subs that are full flavored and delicious. Subway restaurants satisfy the cravings. Subway. Eat fresh. Tonight, the biggest music stars on the planet come together with live performances by Rascal Flatts, Maroon 5, Lenny Kravitz, Fergie, Rihanna, and more. And for the first time ever, your vote will decide who wins. Hosted by Jimmy Kimmel and broadcast live from the Nokia Theater LA, the American Music Awards live coming up tonight following our race coverage right here on ABC. Under caution for the fifth time tonight, Contact the 70 car, Johnny Sauter, and a little contact behind him, Brian Vickers and the 10 car, Patrick Carpentier. That brought out the yellow flag, 106 laps to go. Matt Kenseth has had the best car, first time he has ever led a lap in racing here at Homestead Miami Speedway in a cup car, and he is uh, certainly making up for it tonight. Five times he's led for 125 laps. While we're under yellow, why don't we visit with our in-race reporter, uh, the 99 car, Carl Edwards, sitting back in 14th position. Hey, Carl Edwards, Rusty Wallace up at ESPN. You got us. Got you, Rusty. Hey, buddy, what's the transition the track doing right now from daytime to nighttime? Is it much different at the moment? Uh, for me right now, we've been uh, we've been freeing the car up, so the car is real loose on a short run. I'm just trying to survive that and uh, get going, man. We got to get up there with the, the 1 and the 11 so they don't uh, get my spot there at the banquet. I can tell you're racing for the points, that's for sure. You're doing a good job at it right now. You see most of the passing happen on the top side of the track or the bottom side. Where, where's most of the cars passing at out there, Carl? On the short run, it seems like you can pass on the bottom pretty well. It gets choked up, but uh, long runs at the top for sure. It just seems like the momentum's so important and the way the banking changes here, that's, uh, that's the place. So hopefully we can get a couple on the bottom, move up here in about 10 laps and be fast. All right, buddy, have a good one. We'll talk to you later. 
Hey, Bob Osborne, Andy Petrie, you got a copy? Coming inside. Hey, Bob Osborne, Andy Petrie, you got a copy? Yeah, Andy, how's it going? Hey, pretty good. Just watching you guys' progress. Uh, well, if you've been adjusting on your car, and what kind of adjustments have you made so far? Uh, we, we did some track bar adjustments, some wedge adjustments, and air pressure adjustments. So we're, we're freeing it up a little bit at a time here each time we stop. Uh, with these long green flag runs, we've got to be freer than we had expected here. So we're trying to do it. I'm going to cut you off here, coming to green. So take it easy. Okay, Bob, you're all business, man. Good luck. Bob Osborne, the crew chief for Carl Edwards, a three-time winner this year in 2007. Having a pretty good run here. Yeah, they're doing pretty good. And Bob's got a lot on his mind right now. You can tell he usually is a little more chipper or excited. He's, he's pretty focused <laughs> pretty, right pretty now, intense. Andy. He's kind of cutting us off right there. Remember the Roush Fenway guy said when it gets dark, our cars get good. Remember Greg Biffle has won the last three in a row, said we were terrible here. We were awful until it got really dark, and then we were almost unbeatable. Maybe myself and my teammates will be that way. Well, one of his teammates has been unbeatable even in the daylight, that being the 17 car of Matt Kent. He's watching that bolt gauge, though, if he's got a battery issue and some things may be brewing in that car that haven't shown up yet. Let's see what he does when he jams the throttle for the restart. Will he have the voltage to pull away as he did a moment ago from Denny Hamlin and Martin Truex? Kevin Harvick is a lap down on the inside. He's going to try to hang there and get the lap back the hard way by racing for it instead of being getting the free pass. Here's Hamlin. He is there. Watch the 24 car. Jeff Gordon back in fourth position. And boy, this is the time of the race he drivers really love it. This track is cool right now and it's fast. When you put four tires on, you can really get after it on these restarts. The car is really good. Jeff Gordon struggling with behind uh, his teammate, the five car, who was a lap down trying to get around the five of Kyle Busch. You see the 24 car smoking just a little bit. Andy, we've seen that a lot out of this car throughout the day. Looks a little tire smoke from somewhere. I've seen it all weekend long. That right front tire rubbing the fender. They're traveling these cars so much that the tire rubs, rubs the fender in the hood area. More on Jeff Gordon. Let's check in with Alan Bestwick. Well, let's check in with Jeff Gordon and Steve Letard. Their radio conversation under the caution about their car at this point in the race. Not, not bad. I mean, uh, you know, the, I roll in there, I arc in there, and it's pretty good. And uh, right as I get to the middle, it starts to get a little snug. And when I pick up the throttle, it's a little on the tight side. And then um, down there, one to two is my biggest. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty decent down here in the bottom three or four. It's through one to two that, you know, it starts off good. It just gets real tight um, as I land in there and get the throttle. I just can't do anything to get to rotate. And while there's a lead change on the left-hand side of the screen, we follow up one more time with Jeff Gordon. He's running the bottom because so many guys are running the top. If you want to pass people, you got to go where they're not. Well, that's a good point. You just can't follow a guy if you think you're going to pass him. If you think you go to the top, go to the top. If you get on the bottom, go to the bottom. And if you got momentum, you got an opportunity to do whatever you want at that point, and he's got some momentum now, so he's going around the top side. Jeff Gordon running in fourth position. Uh, the guy he's chasing in points actually behind him on the racetrack. Jimmy Johnson just moved into eighth spot. Danny yep. Hamlin, our leader, the 17 car of Kenseth in second spot. Martin Truex Jr. creeping up there in that one car. There comes the one car. And he is actually faster that time by than either one of the cars in front of it. He saw three different grooves right there from those top three guys. He saw the bottom, top, and the middle with Martin Truex running the middle of the racetrack. I love mean, this racetrack. Now we need to remind everybody this place has got progressive banking. There's three different grooves here. It starts off at 18 degrees on the bottom, 19, then 20, the very top of the track. So these guys can run all over it. It's a great innovation they did here at this track. 99 laps to go and folks in this race a year ago we had rookies finish second and third the second place finisher was martin truex who finished second this race a year ago and who finished third denny hamlin on trouble in turn four the 38 car 38 car that's actually off of turn two david gimelin the robert yates racing car brushes the wall and we stay green thought he was going to lose it and come across the racetrack but he did not great job Oh, he hit that wall pretty good, too. He thought there was enough stuff flew off that car. The caution my flag might come out, but it's still green right now. 
And look at the damage on the right front. It's got it's tore up pretty good there. That's they can peel time. that back though. It's pancake that thing. Good. Show you over between turns one and two, right in front of the 42 of Montoya. Boy, Montoya actually got into him a little bit because the 38 of David Gilliland really slowed down. But Andy, it looks like the back of the car kicked out. And then when he slowed up, Montoya just had nothing to do. And he just got in the back of him a little bit there. Inside of 100 laps to go, Denny Hamlin, who started 33rd last year and finished third. Folks, he started 32nd this year, and he is leading here. Hamlin, our leader. You're watching ESPN on ABC. Welcome back to the Ford 400. Denny Hamlin is our leader. Aerial coverage from high above Homestead Miami Speedway, courtesy of our good friends at Goodyear, the official tire of NASCAR, helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for over 50 years. This is the farewell race for this race car here. It will be full time for the uh, COT car, the car of tomorrow, which will become the car of today. So we can keep the COT. We just can't call it car of tomorrow. We call it car of today. And boy, I want to know what they're going to do with 700 of these cars. We talked about, you know, 50 teams, 15 cars a piece. Man, there is a lot of cars going to be available for somebody to put in a garage or do something. Richard Childers said if you want to get one, you can get one really cheap. You just put it out in the yard and go out and sit in it if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's a buyer's market, obviously. Here about the 17 car. And some of these people are donating cars to different charities and different groups, we're told. Yeah, we're hearing Richard Petty's donating some of his cars to universities to teach some of these kids about racing. Because right now, Andy, they're sitting in these schools and really don't have the real cars, the real hot rods, I call them, to, to play around with. Yeah, this is a good opportunity for a lot of schools to get some real race cars, current race cars, to look at guys in arca are going to be able to get some great race cars to run next year and of course other areas in that within nascar the division of nascar i guarantee you're going to see a lot of restaurants with these cars bolting on poles parked out front too dave and doc you hit it on the head you can run this race car in the bush east series uh next year if you want to and that's going to help carry on a tradition with a generation of earnhardt's the earnhardt jr's cars martin truex's cars paul menard's cars those are going to be shared by a young man named jeffrey earnhardt his nephew and a guy named trevor bain they're going to run those in the bush east series and uh hopefully gain some footholds in that series do you think some of these cars maybe not this one in particular because that's the contact but a lot of good race cars that they can use to learn in that series following this season in fact this year chase austin the yellow fellow drives for me andy it's a 110 inch nascar next cup car you can run the, the bush cars also but we actually found out they give you a 50 pound weight break if you run a cup car and they were actually faster with these cars for the bush series the bush east series It'd be pretty good there by the way, Jeffrey Earnhardt is the son of Kerry Earnhardt. He, of course, obviously is the grandson of the late Dale Earnhardt Sr. as well. So uh, continuing that tradition as they was talking about having an Earnhardt as a part of DEI in the Bush East Division. See Jeff Gordon in his 24 cars running down the 11. And Denny Hamlin, these, these two guys are racing each other and uh, Gordon kind of caught up with them here. You know, one thing I'm noticing right now, we talked about the transition of daytime to nighttime. It looks as though that it's starting to affect some of the cars, although the one holding pretty strong is Kenson throughout the day. Looks like he's got a setup that doesn't matter if it's daytime or nighttime. And evidently, Robbie Reiser's staying up with the racetrack on his adjustments, too. It seems like that one car really likes to run a lot of laps. So the more laps they run, the better his car gets. Uh, the 17's just been good all day, so he's good no matter what. This is one of the best runs I've seen on Jeff Gordon out of the last four or five weeks. He's hanging in a real good third spot right now, but he's about three-tenths of a second slower than the leader, Matt Kenseth. Andy, we heard at the top of the show the 24 car was having a lot of trouble with the nose of the car beginning to slip and slide. With the track cooling off, how much better is it going to help you? Is it going to help the whole car, or will it just help the front of the car? Well, it can actually make the nose scoot more, so if they have a push, they need to start working on it. Look at this one car. He's starting to come alive here, but if the car is tight and the get track gets cooler, the car's going to get tighter, so they have to start adjusting on this car. Yeah, and every single pit stop, I'm going to want him to loosen my car up, take some wedge out, put some air in the right rear tire, something to make that car turn better, because as it gets cooler, just like you said, Andy, the track's not going to change, change the same. Something's going to happen. Still four positions separating Jeff Gordon on the right side of your screen from Jimmy Johnson on the left. Now, Jeff Gordon basically has run in front of Jimmy Johnson for the, for the majority of the day. 
The bad news is he's not in far enough in front of him to be able to make up a significant amount of points. 73 points of differential right now, but folks, uh, there are still 39 cars on the racetrack, so if Jimmy Johnson has troubles, he can still have a pretty poor finish, and Jeff Gordon could become a champion. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC station. Homestead Miami Speedway final race in the chase in 79 laps. The next Cup champ will be crowned. The story in the FedEx race rundown. Points leader Jimmy Johnson started the day on the pole. He only needs to finish 21st or better now to win, and he is safely in eighth. Last race for Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the number eight and for DEI. We know the entrance to pit road is tricky. He found it early. <laughs> he really did. Had a tough day thus far, Susie. Got to an accident early. He's had a tough, tough season, and it continues here today. And Jeff Gordon and Steve Steve Letard looking for any way to make up ground on that 48 team. They are pulling out all stops, but Jimmy Johnson did a great job by leading the first lap, getting those five bonus points, and he has further widened the gap between himself and Jeff Ford. Yeah, well, Jeff said the car isn't bad, but he sits in fourth. That's certainly not enough to get it done. Not the place he wants to be. He needs to be leading the most laps as possible and running up front. He's just not been able to get there today. We talked about the race within the race. Only the top ten go to New York. Right now, Martin Truex and Denny Hamlin are out of that mix, Doc. Thank you, Susie. Brad, by the way, uh, the 83 car, Brian Vickers, driver, and Johnny Sauter both checked out and released at the infield care center after that pretty hard lick back on lap 158. That brought out caution number five. Matt Kenseth, uh, we told you he's coming off of, uh, four consecutive top five finishes. It's been feast or famine for Kenseth in the chase. He's either had uh, really good runs, fifth, fourth, uh, second, and third the last four weeks, or he's had four finishes of 26th or worse early in the chase. So he's either been real good or real bad, and tonight he is really good. But, Doc, you know, talking about Martin Truex a little while, talking about the points, trying to get in the top 10 to go to New York. He's only 16 points behind the 31 car of Jeff Burton, and Burton right now is a lap down. How important is it to sit up on that stay or go up on the stage in that top 10, right? It's very important. I love being there. If you're not on the, in the top 10 of New York, you feel humiliated. You, you don't even want to go up there. So these guys are just desperately wanting to get in the top 10, that's for sure. Martin Truex has come so far this year with his career after being a rookie a year ago, finishing second in this race. So he finished the 2006 season on a high note. Picked up his first win this year. One of four first-time winners. He won at Dover in only his 58th career start. And obviously would love to be able to go to New York in the top ten. It would certainly help uh, his sponsors. Yes, the yellow flag is waving here for the sixth time. 06 Sam Hornish Jr. making his second ever cup start and he has tagged the concrete there with the right side of his Dodge. Well, he's pounded that thing. Looks as though that the suspension's not tore up on it. Let's take a look here. He gets in the corner just real high again. Gets up and scrapes that wall. And we were talking earlier. He's been running the real high line all week long in this car. And he just, there's a lot of grip up there, a lot of speed, but boy, there's just no risky. room for air. Just risky up there. All right, money stops coming your way. Let's go down to our ESPN Dish Tech Center in Tim Brewer. Hey, this is where the crap shoot comes in, folks. We got to put a little bit more tape on the nose of this car. What we're going to do, we're going to try to plant the nose of this thing, get us more downforce. We can run those corners a little bit better. Jeff Gordon, he's got nothing to lose. He's got to go for it right now. Yeah, Tim, you're probably going to see some of these guys putting tape on the grill because it's getting cooler. They're looking for that front downforce to keep these things from sliding around. For more information on adjustments, log on to ESPN.com. Search word know-how. If you just joined our coverage, Jeff Gordon's guys have been talking about the, the, the nose of his 24 car slipping and sliding. If they put some tape on it, you saw Tim Brewer show you, maybe they can plant that nose. And Gordon needs to be able to plant that car at the front of the field and at least lead a lap and uh, maybe hope that something's going to happen to the guy he's chasing in the points, Jimmy Johnson. Cruise up on the wall. And folks, when they stop here, they should be able to make it easily on one more pit stop. Let's go down to Jamie Little. And Matt Kenseth in first gear, 4,800 RPM as he makes the long trek down pit road. He said his car's still a little loose, which is the reason why he's not running as fast as the others. Four tires, a wedge adjustment. That's it for the 17. Mike. Mike Ford.
has been calling for minute changes on the 11 car all day long, and this is another one. They're going to go down an eighth of a round on the left rear four tires and fuel. Alan? And Jeff Gordon, that lower left-hand box, his crew discussing, doing what Tim Brewer described just a minute ago, putting some tape on the nose of that car. It's going to be a four-tire change in adjustments on the 24, Dave. After saying it was pretty good, Jimmy Johnson said, if you want to go faster, more comfort into the corner, turn the center better, and more grip up. That'll be a track bar adjustment and an air pressure adjustment for the 48 crew. Jeff Gordon's crew will beat the 48 out. And how about Kim's a 12 and a half second for Robbie Reiser and company down there. Great pit stop on the 17th. Kurt Busch up a couple of spots. Denny Hamlin back three positions. Working caution for the sixth time a night. Lap 193. Sam Hornish is Dodge has contact with the wall. Back at Homestead Miami Speedway, ESPN coverage on ABC. We'd like to thank all the fans and viewers that have welcomed us back into your living rooms on Saturdays and Sunday afternoons and Sunday evenings throughout the year for our coverage of NASCAR. NASCAR Motorsports coverage, uh, it is certainly a mission of joy and love for us, and it is a journey. We're thrilled that our journey is just beginning here with NASCAR Bush Series, soon to be the NASCAR Nationwide Series and NASCAR Nextel Cup, which will become the NASCAR Sprint Cup in 2008. 71 laps to go here as we bring down the curtain on the 2007 season, and we will crown a champion here at Homestead Miami Speedway. Matt Kenza trying to pick up the win. Jimmy Johnson trying to pick up a title. Jeff Gordon having something to say about that. Gordon uh, in fourth position. Jimmy Johnson back in the sixth spot. Boy, Johnson, he is just not laying back. I mean, he's not been super fast, but he's been consistent. He's in the position where he's got to be, Andy, in order to win this title. Boy, I'll tell you that he's had to dodge a lot of cars. He's had to see a lot of cars in that windshield. So it just makes it a lot tougher. I'd like to see that car out front. Our Brad Doherty says the 17 car. Matt Kent's is going to win. We'll have to wait and see. He's looking good right now. Looking awfully good. He will come down to the green flag, and they stack up behind him. Truex, the two car of Bush, and then Jeff Gordon as he takes the green and sail into one. Well, these guys and these restarts, I mean, they just go like the Banshee. You see Kevin Harvick down there trying to get a lap back, trying to get going, and just flying around the bottom of that racetrack. His teammate, Jeff Burton, just got the lucky dog. He's back on the lead lap now, so Harvick's fighting to get his back. Here comes the one car of Martin Truex. He is digging to try to get there as well. Holds it within about five feet. Now pulls to the inside of the 17 car, and he's got a lap car on the bottom of the racetrack. Harvick and Kenseth. Is he going to be able to get between them? Whoa! High racing. Aboard that 31 car, Jeff Burton getting back in the lead lap. That's not at all what Martin Truex wanted to see because Martin's tra chasing him to get up in the top 10, and now he's going to be tr chasing the 29 car of Kevin Harvick. As right now, our points are showing Harvick in the 10th position. Top 10, the points, remember, in the NASCAR chase. Those are the ones that go on the stage. Top of your screen, that's the running order on the racetrack. Line number two in the chase shows you where they are in terms of points. Jeff Gordon, 81 points back of the 48 car Jimmy Johnson right now. Boy, some of the lap times are turning out there right now, guys, are some of the fastest I've seen all day. In fact, they are the fastest laps we've seen since the start of the race. So, Andy, a lot of speed in that racetrack right now. The cooler it gets, the faster they go. We're going to see these cars even get faster before the race is over. One car trying to move on the bottom of the racetrack. He got down there before, but he couldn't hold it because he had Harvick there. Now he has Harvick behind him somewhat. See if Truex can hold that bottom roof and be able to make the pass. No, he still can. Well, right now you see Harvick sitting in the third, you know, car back, but he is actually the first guy going for the lucky dog. And behind him, it's Kyle Busch, and he can see him back there. So Harvick, he can't get out of the throttle all in. He's got to go for it right now. Here comes Jeff Gordon, three wide off turn four. He's catching these guys while they're racing each other. Gordon can afford to be aggressive here. He just this is aggressive as he wants to be. That's I like this position Jeff Gordon's in right now. I mean, he probably does. He wants to be leading the points. But because he's the chaser, he can chase and get aggressive and get mean and get angry and go 
afford it. If you're Steve Letard and the guys behind the wall, how, how much are you liking the fact that your guy, a four-time cup champion, Jeff Gordon, is up on that steering wheel just driving for all he's worth right now? Oh, they love this guy, man. And they know they're getting Jeff Gordon's 100% every lap. They, 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 go to, they go to battle for him. Alan Bestwick. Well, Doc, the one thing that they want to keep in mind, and Steve Letard talked about this with me this morning up at their team caller, there are still so many cars on the racetrack that if Jimmy Johnson has a problem now and they keep running in the top five, they're going to win the championship. So they want their driver to be aggressive and be up in that top five. They don't want him to be so aggressive that he chances crashing the car until they get closer to the finish, just in case something were to happen to the uh, 48 car. Now I want to talk about the guy who's third in points starting this day. We talked about different races within the top ten. The good Boyer car has a vibration. They think it's an engine problem. Boyer is trying to hang on. Kyle Busch was 155 points behind him starting the day. If Boyer were to fall out of this race, Kyle Busch is a lap down right now. If somehow Kyle can come back and get a good finish, he might steal third away in points and make it a 1-2-3 for Hendrick, but Boyer will have to fall out. And Kyle's going to have to come back and have a really good finish for that to be a possibility. Right now, he's back in 22nd place. Uh, thank you, Alan. A little bit of a wobble there for the five car. And the point is, the 48 car, they realize that there are still 30 or 40 cars on the racetrack. And say, if something were to happen right now to 48, as you see Kyle Busch there back in the pack, if something were to happen to Jimmy Johnson right now and say he would end up going to the garage area and finish 40th, all the 24 car have to do is finish about 16th and he could win the, the championship. He's but in third right now, so that wouldn't be a problem. There are so many scenarios how Jimmy Johnson can lose this thing, but as long as he stays clear of all these guys like he is right now, he's in safe territory. Whoa, that's tight right there. Three wide. And these are two cars trying to run down Kevin Harvick to get that lucky dog. 48 car of Jimmy Johnson, 24 of Jeff Gordon. Both these cars, as well as the five of Kyle Busch, owned by one Rick Hendrick. And we talked to Chad Knauss about Rick Hendrick's vision for these teams. His goal was to have these two teams battling for wins and battling for championships at, at all costs. And the way that he put it together was we weren't going to have two teams in one building. We were going to have one team with two race cars. And it, it's a completely different approach. Uh, as you walk into any other competitor shop, you'll see one group of cars on one side of the facility, another group on the other side of the facility, and they're, they're segregated. Um, what we've got going on in the 2448 shop isn't that way. Uh, the 80-plus the people that we've got working there, they all work on each other cars. And it's called the Hendrick Way. Rick Hendrick, you saw him a moment ago. That's the way he runs his dealerships, the way he runs his businesses. It's all about cooperation, hand in hand. It just makes everyone better in terms of the team concept. Dave? And, Doc, this week, Rick Hendrick said one more of the ways that he does things he's going to do for the 48, or try to do, that he did for Jeff Gordon in 1999, and that was to sign him to a lifetime driving contract. Rick's saying, my goal is simple, to keep Jimmy Johnson with me for as long as he races. Now they become more similar if he gets that to happen. That's a pretty cool concept, you know, at least two cars and one shop is one team. So instead of the crew guys going to work with a 24 shirt and another guy having a 48 shirt, they all go to work with a Hendrick shirt. And when you walk in that shop, those cars are like 10 feet away up on jack stands. So they park eight feet away in the garage area at the racetrack and they're about 10 feet away in that shop at Hendrick Motorsports just outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, Gordon's working hard underneath Mar uh, Mark Truex Jr. trying to get this spot. He's got, a fa he's got one of the fastest cars on the track right now. Well, there's one thing for sure, Andy. This 24 car, as his son has went down, and the track is cool right now. We're in the nighttime here. Almost dead Miami speed. This definitely helps this 24 car. Whatever he had going on at the beginning of this race, this cooler track has fixed it. Jeff Gordon working over the back of the one car, trying to get there. Remember, he is yet to lead a lap today. He needs to get up and lead those. All that helps. It just that's a quick uh, five points. And you never know, as you heard Alan Bestwick say, with so many cars on the racetrack, the 48 can't get too aggressive because one mistake, and he gets a terrible finish. Last time by, Jeff Gordon, the 24 car, faster than the leader. Martin Truex not making it easy on Jeff Gordon right here. Yeah, boy, if Jeff Gordon can clear Martin Truex, we're going to see how fast he really is. Cause he, he's getting pinned down at the bottom of the track more than he really wants to be and I gotta believe he just needs more room to slide that car up off the corner to get it going yeah you get it he's making it just a little bit at a time here still can't get clear though 
Last two years, the winner of this race at Homestead Miami Speedway has not taken the lap, the lead, until lap 214. Last year, Greg Bipple took the lead finally. And lap 230 in 2005, it was Greg Bipple. So, folks, it's about now when someone begins to emerge toward the front and goes on and wins this race by history. We'll see if that, uh, that someone this year is the one car or maybe it's the 24 making the move. Rick Hendrick, two drivers battling for a championship. Either way, he's going to become the recipient of a seventh cup title. We welcome you back to the Ford 400, where Matt Kenseth continues to cruise on our lead. And this is the final NASCAR race of the season, the 36th race. And the two teammates who are dominating, and their story is worth telling again. Because Jimmy Johnson, a few years back, wanted to crash into the Cup Series. He approached Jeff Gordon, who was his hero. He said a couple of teams had come after him. He'd been successful in feeder circuits. Jeff said, hang on. He went to Rick Hendricks, and he said, you know, I think this young man's got some skill. Let's see if we can get him a ride. And Rick said to him, Jeff, you put your money where your mouth is. And ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Gordon owns part of the car that Jimmy Johnson is piloting toward a back-to-back -back chase trophy here today. The only thing that is going to cost Jimmy Johnson consecutive titles is bad racing luck. Think of what's going on right now as the Tour de France, the man in the yellow jersey is driving number 48. He's in a cocoon. No one wants to tango with him. Rusty Wallace will tell you what drivers are like right here. They do not want to be the guy in the black hat at this moment. If there is bad luck, then yes, Jeff can win. Otherwise, folks, we're going to have back-to-back -back championships by one Jimmy Johnson. Up we go to speed now. Let's start off here. Jamie Little. Jamie. Hi, Brent. The man crashing the party at the front of the field all night long. Matt Kenseth. After that quick last pit stop, 12-second pit stop, they made a small adjustment to cure that loose condition. He hasn't said a word on the radio, and if you ask the team, they say Matt not talking is a great thing. He continues to charge home, looking for his first victory here. Dave? The end of the year has been good for this one team. Martin Truex and team accomplishing some goals they really wanted to as uh, they race side by side with Kurt Busch right there. One of them was getting a pole so they can uh, race at the uh, Budweiser shootout at Daytona. They accomplished that at Texas. Here they're running well once again, finishing second in this race before. They'd like to win it, but running strong at the end of the year. Another year-end goal, Alan. What a night it's been for Kurt Busch who just took over the second spot. Lap 78, the problem on the left here of the pit stop. Lap 99, a green flag pit stop. Went to 30. Third place, a lap down. Lap 149, got a yellow flag just as he was about to have to make a green flag pit stop that got him back onto the lead lap. He might be a race winner later. He's fast. Watch him. Jeff Gordon just calling into Steve Latard, his crew chief right now, describing the handling on their car. Gordon talking about losing a little bit of the security as far as the feeling of his car as it gets into the corner. Still having some trouble with the front end grip the longer they run on this set of tires. Look for Gordon to pit around lap 244 if we stay green, Mike. Denny Hamlin trying to make a move around the outside of Jeff Gordon to pick up a spot. They're dead even as they head through the corner. Hamlin said after they fell out of contention for the championship, he was adjusting his goal. The attitude was just to go for wins. That's what they've done tonight. Right now, the car pretty good. He says it's a little bit loose up top, but tight on the bottom, but looking pretty strong right now as he bypasses the 24. Dave? One of the hardest things for the 48 team to do has been holding back. They've been very fast at the end of this year, and they've won the last four races. Today, the car has been very good, and recall their last adjustments on pit road. Jimmy said he was fine with the race car, but if we wanted to go faster, let's try some things. Right now, they're sort of maintaining, haven't really picked up the track position, but still willing to try things to race fast, Mike. Carl Edwards came in here with a couple of goals tonight. One, to get back to victory lane, and two, to stay inside the top ten. He desperately wants to go to New York. He told his publicist this morning, I want to go there because, oddly enough, he may be the only one to say this, I want to give a speech. Right now he's still in the top ten, although the car is getting just a little bit tight. Jamie? Well, one man desperate for something is Dave Blaney wants to maintain that top 35 in the points.
held the ninth spot until just then. That was where he restarted. The car's been pretty neutral all night long. Mark's already had four top fives here at this track and trying to move forward tonight in that 0-1 car. Jamie? And David Reagan in the sixth car. Congratulations go out to he and Jack Roush for winning the Rookie of the Year standings in the Bush Series. He's actually running for it tonight as well for the Cup Series. Juan Pablo Montoya, of course, would have to have a bad night for him to get that. But right now, David Reagan, the highest running rookie as he completes his first year in the Cup and Bush Series. And right behind him, Jeff Burton, his night got started in a tough way. Just a couple laps in, he had those issues. He had fender rub, then his tire went down. He came in and went a lap down. He continues to forge to the front. This has definitely been a year he's disappointed with. They expected the charge for the championship, and it just has not been that way, especially in the shape of Jeff Burton. Keeping it up there, working his way, trying to get to the front. Stop. Battle back up front, the one car, Drew X and the 11 of Denny Hamlin. You talked about how much Denny Hamlin wants to go to New York and be on that stage. He's on the bottom of the racetrack here. Drew X about as far away as he can get until they come off the corner. They nearly come together there on the straightaway. They've been battling back and forth every single lap. One will go to the high side, one will go to the bottom side. And boy, they got almost identical cars for speed, and they just can't seem to get away from each other. These guys finished second and third here a year ago in this race behind Greg and Biffle, and they are running second and third here tonight. Make that third and fourth here tonight behind Kenza and Kurt Busch. 40 laps to go. Remember that final pit stop coming up in about 10 to 12 laps, and that should be very interesting to watch. Matt Kenza trying to pick up his second win in 2007. What a dominant performance. Seven times he led for 179 laps. Back after these messages and a word from our ABC station. Tonight, the biggest music stars on the planet come together with live performances by Rascal Flatts, Maroon 5, Lenny Kravitz, Fergie, Rihanna, and more. For the first time ever, your vote will decide who wins. Hosted by Jimmy Kimmel and broadcast live from the Nokia Theater LA. The American Music Awards live tonight following this race right here on ABC. All right, Andy Petra, I got a question to ask you. We were just talking. If this 23's got second place in the points locked up, right? And these cars are, I mean, they're falling off almost two seconds because of tire wear. If he pitted right now, I know it's a gamble. How much time do you think he can pick up? And maybe if it goes free, he can win this race. This would be a good time for them to short pit and bring Jeff down pit road. Nothing to lose and a lot to gain. Just bring him down pit road. If it goes green, he'll wind up out front. And, uh, and have some track position on these guys. So it'd be worth a gamble. If I was Steve Tart, I'd, I'd just roll the dice right here. Roll the dice, why not bring him in? And then uh, if it cycles through, you're at least gonna lead a lap and you may you may, you may get lucky. So, so what if it's a mistake? If it's a mistake, he's still got second to points locked up. But at least he can go for a win if he makes the major gamble, which a lot of these guys can't afford to do. That's a great idea. I didn't know drivers could think that. Good. No, you thought that up. Oh. <laughs> you thought that up. Andy Petrie you thought that up. I just want to let everybody know he did that. <laughs> oh, you've heard that from a crew chief before. Well, when he said that, it got me all excited. I'm like, hey, that's pretty smart. Alan? Well, Rusty, it came out of your mouth so just uh, about the same time. They were talking about it on Jeff Gordon's team radio. from the car. He is falling back and losing spots, but again, the counterbalance on Steve Letarte's position is this. What if something happens to Jimmy Johnson in the late laps? That's what's holding him back for now. He's hesitating on pulling the trigger, and you know what an agonizing call to make the short pit. It is agonizing, but this is the perfect time to do it. I haven't seen anybody or any reason to think this 48 is going to have any trouble. Just roll the dice. Try to make something happen here. You're not going to finish worse than second in the point, so why not gamble and go for it? Come on, Stevie. Bring him in. All right, Alan, go down there and tell him that our Andy Pete said pit now. Yeah. And I, uh, I know Rusty here is going to agree with him. on his mind without me telling him what to do. Really. Okay. Yeah, he gets paid to make those calls. We'll see what's going to happen here. Now, Jeff Gordon, you heard talking about they were going to pit around lap 244 to 245, and that is uh, just about seven or eight laps away. Well, somebody heard you. I think the one car may be coming a little bit early. Here's Martin Truex Jr. in the one car. It was being shown back in the fourth position. He uh, damaged on the right side from an earlier contact about lap 45. He comes down at 45 miles an hour to make his final stop. And this move right here could win in the race. 
if the rest of the guys stay in the track. They burns. Martin Truex Jr. reporting now that that car is loose off the corner and uh, not that bad. So what they will do is make an air pressure adjustment for him and change four tires. Again, most of the way through the corner is just fine. It's just that last little second off the corner that it wants to get away from him. Two tires stop for the one team. Oh, Bono's rolling the dice here. Two tires, pitting early. It's probably going to tip the hand of some of these other guys, though. They're going to see this and they're going to, ah, they're going to, I got to get on pit road. I don't want this guy to get too much time on me. That's going to put the uh, pressure back on Robbie Riser for this 17 car. How, do, how long do I leave him out? Well, how long do you leave him out? Well, I'm going to pit him pretty quick. I, you know, I, I don't want this guy to get much of a lead on me. I might let him, I will watch him a lap or two, and then I'm coming down pit road. How about the guy who's won here the last three years in a row? Greg Biffle coming down for what should be his final stop, Mike. And what's more remarkable, to give you some perspective on how remarkable that three-race winning streak is, did it with three completely different setups, and this will be a fourth. The car has been pretty good tonight, no, although not spectacular. A two-tire change you see on the 16 car, looking for some track position here. 16 car Biffle coming out and a 24 crew we are told are climbing up on the wall, so maybe uh, they are going to come in a little bit earlier than they had anticipated. There are the DuPont guys uh, for Jeff Gordon. They were talking about pitting. You heard Alan Beswick say lap 244, 245. It's 241 right now. So maybe they're going to listen to their driver and say, let's get in there and uh, get some tires. Boy, look what fresh tires does, though. I mean, the one car is just shooting around that 24. Watch that acceleration. Gone. Boy, new tires. That's Mr. Feel Good right there when you get those babies time. on you. This time, this time, this time. Four, ten, four. I think he pitted too late, Andy. Yeah, he pitted too late to get the advantage. Now the, the move might be to get four tires and get even give up a little track position but have better tires in case the caution does come out right after this and then they'll have better tires than the other guys. I'd do something different. I wouldn't do what they're doing. That's what I'd do. I'd do four tires. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Here comes a 24 car, which could possibly be the final pit stop of the year. Steve Letard watching his driver come down pit road here, getting ready to make this stop. Talking about it on the radio to Jeff. Here he comes to his pit stall. Now, remember, they've run a full fuel load, so they're going to have to sit here and wait. If they choose to take four tires, they won't be here that much longer because they have to get the car. Well, actually, they don't have to get the car full of fuel because they only have a few laps to go. But remember, the car is empty. If they choose to fill it for handling purposes, they'll be there that long for the four tires. All right, they went for the four for the handling, and they're going to hope this thing is just going to flat fly on the racetrack right now while Matt Kenseth is staying on the track and Kurt Busch and Hamlin. Oh, there he goes. Look at this, Andy. Here comes Kenseth then. You heard Robbie Reiser, guys. They couldn't afford to leave him out. He's headed down to you, Jamie Little. And Robbie Reiser perhaps making his last pick call here for Matt Kenseth. He said he's going to short fuel. They're not going to fool it. Fill it all the way up. It's not needed right now. They're going to do a wedge adjustment. And let's see how many tires they want to take. He's going to make the call. Four tires for Matt Kenseth. Remember, last six stop was 12.2, and it's 12.9 again. Alex. And Kurt Busch was running in second place when he came down pit road. Little trouble on the right rear. They had to go back and catch a lug, it looked like. They'll come around on a four-tire change here for Kurt Busch. We'll see what kind of time this might cost him to Matt Kenseth, Dave. Down to the nerve center where Chad Knauss came down from the pit box moments ago to have a group huddle with his team. They talked about the final stop, staying together. Jimmy's a little bit close to the pit wall, but they do manage to get the car jacked up just fine. A four-tire change, slight air pressure adjustment, pretty comfortable for the driver right now, according to the driver. Mike? The call from Mike Ford on the 11 cars for four tires of fuel, but only a can and a half of fuel. They go to work now on the left-hand side, making their service. There he's down and away. Carl Edwards now in. We mentioned how badly he wants to stay inside the top 10. A very quick pit stop. He's away after a two-tire change. Adjustment on the left side. That's it for Juan Pablo Montoya.
Montoya, 14.4 seconds, a good stop. Jamie? And rookie of the year contender, David Reagan, another Roush car, guys. We talked about it. The sun goes down. These cars come to life. David Reagan worked his way into the top ten. He qualified great. They're going to do four tires. He said he's a little tight off. They put that tape on the front. He's down and away. Huh? Final 20 laps here at Homestead Miami Speedway. And, boy, some guys going two, some going four tires. A 26 car, Jamie McMurray, being shown as the leader. One of the final cars to make a pit stop. He will be the final car to cycle through on the pit road. That would make Martin Truex Jr. the leader, but Truex gets passed by Kenza. And here comes McMurray down pit road at 45 miles an hour. And here's the battle up front. The one car, remember, took only two tires. The 17 of Kenza took four tires, and the four tires does make a big difference. It's a big difference, but this one car's got that high line, and, and it's going to be difficult. He's making it difficult on Matt Kenza. If Mack can get him cleared here, he'll be able to sail on, but, yeah, it looks like he's going to get him cleared here. You know, it looked like the one car actually pitted about six or eight laps early from when he needed to, but actually Matt Kenseth was due in at lap 245 and he hit pit road at 244, so it was pretty well scheduled. Matt came in right when he needed to. Now he's got four tires. He's actually the best car in the racetrack in the best shape at the moment. Yeah, he's got the lead, too, so that doesn't hurt him. <laughs> four tires full of gas and got the lead with 19 to go. Ooh, that's feeling good right there. What about Gordon and Johnson, folks? They've been inseparable in the garage, inseparable on the racetrack and in the point standings, and uh, they are currently sixth and seventh. Jeff Gordon is sixth, and there's Jimmy in seventh spot. One position away, and the interval is 87 points. Right now in the standings, remember, uh, Jimmy Johnson led a lap, and Jeff Gordon has not. This thing's not going to be over to the checkered flag because if he blows up with one lap to go, he's still in trouble. I mean, he has just got to keep pedaling. Actually, if he blows up with two laps to go, he's in trouble. With one lap to go, he can probably, yeah, he's, he's in good shape because there's only uh, 16 cars on the lead lap. And Jerry, what was it, 19th or better, no matter what Jeff Gordon does, he can lock it up. Now, that's if Gordon wins. And, and led the most laps. Now it's 21st because Gordon can't lead the most laps. So, obviously, Jimmy Johnson would like to finish 21st or better in the running in seventh spot. 17 laps to go. Season finale, Homestead Miami Speedway. What a dominant performance by Matt Kenseth, who has led eight times for 197 laps. One win this year for Kenseth, that coming early in the year at California, where he swept both the NASCAR Bush Series and Cup races in the same weekend. And I tell you, that car, Matt Kenseth, that is one good-looking car. I like that black and yellow under Andy. Hey, what's that remind you of? Black and yellow, old Miller car I used to see running around. That old number two Miller car, I like that color. <laughs> I like the way that thing's handling, too. Look at that car. I mean, it's just been, the nose has been on the ground all night long. Matt has been able to maneuver this thing anywhere on the racetrack. It's not over yet, but I'll tell you, he's got a good car tonight. Well, coming up later tonight, 10 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN, NASCAR Now. We'll close out our season coverage. Updates you on all that happened here in this season finale for the NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series, the NASCAR Craftsman uh, NASCAR Nextel Cup Series. And, of course, uh, we'll update all the things and how the points broke down and who's going on the stage in New York and more on the championship celebration, 10 o'clock Eastern time, NASCAR Now. We're going to have plenty of post-race coverage here, too, when this race is over. Caution, Tony Stewart issues on the racetrack with a 20 car. Oh, man, he's hit this hard. He's hit hard here. For the whole back end off of it, the left side. Here, see if we can fix it now. Here, see if you can fix it now. Obviously, he's probably pretty upset with the way he was handling. He's really upset now. Tony Stewart, seventh caution Defender flag. Though, we got to put four tires on this thing. Greg Zipidelli. And Doc, I was just about to say, I saw the 07 car, Clint Boyer, come down pit road with another problem, and maybe Tony Stewart could have caught him, but now it's not going to happen because they both had the same problem on the same lap. So we see what happened to Stewart, top of your screen. The car just by himself just spins backwards and tags the wall and then slams it with the left front. And you never see Tony Stewart hardly ever lose in a car. He's one of the best drivers out here, especially with a loose car. So this thing had to be Yeah, you got to think really he was dealing loose. with some kind of an issue there because that car just snapped around on him. Okay, what are these guys going to do here? 
Well, you can so, hear the frustration in Tony Stewart's voice. Now, what do you what do you do? If you're a Kenseth, these guys that have pitted, you don't need to, you don't need to do much. You, do you gamble if you're one of the guys on the back part of the lead? Yeah, no, sure. Absolutely. Come on in and get some tires, but uh, Matt's gonna stay out here and kind of looks like he's gonna make it make a play for this and the guy's gonna follow him. He's pretty well gotta stay out in. I mean, yeah, he's got four tires. To go. I mean he is so fast right now, it's incredible. Surprised this morning, these guys didn't try to come down pit road and get tired. Yeah, right now, Mark Truex is thinking, I wish I'd have put four instead of two on this thing, but he was going for it. Very few takers among the lead cars working caution for the seventh time, just 13 laps to go here in the 2007 season. Back at the Homestead Miami Speedway, Jimmy Johnson races in seventh position with teammate Jeff Gordon in sight. Chad, what are the thoughts right now? You can see the 24. You know where he is. Yeah, I mean, obviously, at this point, all we need to do is just kind of keep him in an eye shot, and we'll be okay. And that's it's kind of the goal at this point right there. If they would have pitted, we probably would have come down and pitted with them. Uh, we've, we've played a little bit conservative here at the end, just trying to do what they do to make sure we don't get off sync. When they pitted, we pitted shortly thereafter to make sure we didn't have any problems and, and stay close to them. And, you know, I just can't say enough about this whole Lowe's team and, uh, and the DuPont team, both. Both cars in here in the season finale, running in the top ten, battling for the championship. It's just a dream come true for what we want to do in our shop. And I just can't say enough about Jimmy. He's just done a phenomenal job all year long. Allen's with Steve Letard. Steve, you've been working on your car all night. Tell us where your race stands right now. Yeah, the DuPont Chevrolet is just a little too tight here at the end. But, you know, we're sitting on four tires. A couple guys have two tires. We're hoping to get another top ten out of it and hopefully give Jeff the record. But, yeah, I can't say enough about everybody at Hendrick Motorsports. I have these two cars, one, two, in points. To win as many races as we won this year, I just really feel blessed to be part of this organization. Really proud to be part of it. Thank you, Steve. Steve should be proud of the fact that Jeff Gordon could set the record. He was talking about 30 top ten finishes, the all-time record in a single season. Head to head, take a look there. You see four wins in the chase, two for Gordon. How about uh, seven versus eight top tens? These two guys have just dominated this chase for the next Dale Cup here in 2007. Ten laps away from concluding the year at Homestead Miami Speedway in aerial coverage high above Homestead. Brought to you by our good friends at Goodyear, the official tire of NASCAR, helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for over 50 years. How about the Allstate good hands move? Now, how many times has Jeff Burton dodged bullets here during this race afternoon? Cars up on the racetrack, a cut tire early on, and they're just able to get underneath Tony Stewart on the most recent caution flag on lap 253. All problems up front with the 17 car. Could there be trouble? Somebody said something and got these guys alerted there because they jumped up on that wall real quick. Pace car off the racetrack. Kenseth, remember we told you that he had a battery issue. Does he have the voltage? He's worried about some brake fluid. Can he hang on for 10 more laps? Green flag. Kenseth leads him down. Truex Jr. there. Kurt Busch making a move with a dodge on the inside for second spot. Kurt Busch and his two car had the fastest car on the track before that caution came out. And man, he had just blew past everybody. Kenseth got a good start, but Kurt Busch is flying right now. Now he's got nobody between him and that 17. And boy, he needed all the time he can to catch the 17 car, Kenseth, but uh, we'll see if he can do it. But he did everything he could do now. He's cleared him. We're hearing possible flat right front or concerns about the right front on the 17 car of Kenseth. It's pretty fast right now. I think he looks pretty good. I, I can't imagine he would have a flat tire as fast as his car's running. Yeah, his lap speeds look real good right now, although Kurt Busch is faster by about two tenths of a second. Battle Nine for, laps to go. He can catch him, Jerry. Battle for third. Right side of your screen. The one and 11. Denny Ham on the 11. The one car of true of Martin Truex Jr. And here comes Gordon into the fray. Gordon's been great on these short runs, so he might be able to get a couple spots here. Gordon is fifth right now. Jimmy Johnson. You heard Chad Canal say we just want to keep Gordon in sight. Jimmy Johnson back in seventh position. Well, I think that 17 car is okay right now. This last time by one tenth of a second faster than Kurt Busch. Must have, must have had some rubber buildup on the right front tire, causing the driver to feel like the tire was flat. Really, when it wasn't. 
Battle for third position as the one car and now the 24 car. Jeff Gordon up on the steering wheel. Seven laps to go. And they're going to go three wide off the corner. Boy, those two tires on Mark Truex is really killing his car right now. The four tires with Gordon is just outrunning them big time right at the moment. Last lap by the two car was faster than Matt Kenseth. He's got six laps to get it done. These two are swapping it back and forth, and maybe the two car of Kurt Busch can actually get a little bit of a draft off the lead car of Kansas and catch him in the straightaways, Andy. Kurt Busch a tenth quicker that lap as well. Laps winding down. Six laps to go. Got to be nervous as Kenthus has been all night long leading this race with now Kurt Busch chasing him down. And he thinks he's got it locked up, but he really doesn't at the moment because Bush has just got one fast dodge right now. See the 24 car flashing by Gordon now up to fourth position, the 48 car. There's Jimmy Johnson back in seventh spot. He's got to hang on for five more laps, and he'll be a 2007 Cup Series champion. He's just sitting in the rocking chair right there, not going to push anything. Here's Stewart's car, his, his uh, damaged car limping around here. Interval stabilized somewhat up front between Kenseth and Kurt Busch as Kenseth now back up on the wheel and it stayed at about uh, 10 to 12 car lengths. They run, run identical laps last lap. And right now Tony Stewart needs to stay going because Kurt Busch is only 20 points behind him at the moment. So it's crucial that Stewart stays on the racetrack to hold that sixth position in the points at the moment. The one car, by the way, of Truex back 11th in points. You know why he's battling. He wants to get in the top 10 and get on that stage in New York if he possibly can and also get a good finish here in the finale. Hamlin goes by third. Gordon is fourth. Edwards fifth. And now Truex, as you mentioned, Rusty, only two tires of sitting duck. He is dropping back. So John Johnson's trying to get past Truex in the bottom of the racetrack right now. He's been running the middle to the top. Now he's dead on the bottom. He's just going to take advantage. He's not going to push it. He's not going to push it. He's just two laps away from his championship. Only thing that could ruin it here would be to push too hard. The cars. We, watched, we watched him all year long, Andy. I think he's going to go for it. What do you think? I mean, he's on that bottom. He'll take it if it's there, but he's not going to push the issue. Wasn't going to back into a championship. You see wife Shani sitting there at right side uh, watching, not warning, really wanting to watch. Chandra, Jimmy's wife. Watching and hoping and probably wondering about all the discussions they've had the last few weeks. All right, white flag last lap, guys. It's been a long year. Jimmy Johnson in seventh position trying to battle to get in the sixth spot. Up front, Matt Ken's a dominant performance by the Wisconsin driver in the final ride with Robbie Reiser, his longtime friend and crew chief atop the box. Reiser will bid farewell and become general manager at Roush Fenway. But what a way to go out as Kenseth comes out of turn four and Matt Kenseth will win the season finale at Homestead Miami Speedway. Oh, the emotion now. Chad Canal. Phenomenal. You guys are off the bank, boys. We're going to tear it up tonight. Nothing like back-to-back -back championship. And you could see the emotion just pour out in the face of Chandra there. Chandra Johnson, Jimmy's wife, and now Jimmy can put the net down, take a deep breath because he has done it, folks. Thank you to everybody on the 24 team, Steve LeCarb. Oh, there's the hug. Chad Canals, oh my gosh, what a family in this Hendrick Motorsports team. And look there, the two drivers. 86 point lead, but you never know until it's completely over and it's finally done.
Tart, Chad Knauss, and all. Jimmy's dad, what a big smile there. How proud can they be? Hugging his daughter-in-law. Rick Hendrick, you heard his story, the ranks of Rich's story, wife Linda. And kids will make this to blow the engine in the race winning car, but he doesn't care. He celebrates, and there's the championship flag for Jimmy Johnson. He began the day on the pole in the final race of the year, and he ends the night as the series NASCAR Next L Cup champion. Let's go down to Dave Burns. Chad now is getting the probably the, the hug from the man who appreciates it most, Rick Hendrick, car owner. Chad, last year was an accomplishment for the whole 48 team, actually for the whole organization. What does it mean to repeat? Man, I don't know. It still hasn't hit me yet. It's just it's it's just it's a testament to these guys and everybody at Hendrick Motorsports and what they do and the preparation that goes into what happens with our race cars, with our engines, with our chassis, I mean just everything. It was such a difficult season for everybody with with the COT and the, uh, the development of that car and that chassis, and then obviously with General Motors and NASCAR bringing out the R07 for the Chevrolet teams, it was even more difficult for us. And the guys in the engine shop just did a great job, Jim Wall and Jeff Andrews, of getting those engines out there for us and, and making it to where they would live and build great power. So I just don't, I mean, I'm I'm beside myself, I'll be quite honest. It's a, it's a great day, it's a great feeling, and man, I can't wait for Daytona. You guys uh, didn't have too many hiccups out there at all today. How difficult was it to dial back this weekend, Chad, and just make sure you didn't lose? Well, we really didn't dial back. You know, obviously, we, we, we came here with uh, the thought process of doing everything we could to sit on the pole. We were fortunate enough to be able to do that. We wanted to have a race car that Jimmy could really do whatever he wanted with. And, and fortunately enough, we were able to get it. It's not always easy to do, but our car was really, really good today. And I kind of wish we weren't going for the championship because maybe we'd been a little bit more aggressive and try to go for the win. But uh, obviously, you have to do what's first and foremost on your mind, and that was win the championship. It's a, it's a long season, and for the guys out there that we're racing against, it's pretty phenomenal what we've had. And you know, congratulations to Robbie Reiser and Matt Kenseth. You know, Robbie's last race is crew chief with Matt to go out there and win. That's pretty phenomenal. All right. Well, uh, Chad, uh, Jimmy said something about a party, so we'll let you go. Congratulations, and uh, once again, Chad, thanking everyone at Hendrick Motorsports. That's a big team effort, Mike. Dave, speaking of parties, there's a party in the 17 camp, no doubt. Robbie Reiser just leaned in the cockpit and congratulated Matt, but this is a pretty special win, I would imagine, for you as you walk off a winner here in Homestead. Oh, no doubt about it. First of all, I'd like to congratulate Jimmy Johnson, that whole race team, and, and Henrik Motorsports for what they've done. Uh, but, man, did we come on at the end of the season, you know. Uh, what a performance by our team. Uh, you know, we got so far behind in this chase, and it looked like we were, we were never going to get out of 12th there for a while, but... Uh, a coming like run like this at the end of the year is just uh, just a privilege to be a part of this this uh, 17 bunch. I mean, the DeWalt guys have been on the money on pit road all season long, and and this is the end of my DeWalt uh, segment, I guess, if you want to say that. But I'll be back to work tomorrow morning working on race cars. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to help them win another championship and help Roush Fenway win a championship. But uh, what an honor and a privilege to work with Matt Kenseth and that whole group, and really looking forward to Chip Bowling taking this team over and, and doing a lot better job than I did. To win in your final race as a crew chief, what are the emotions right now? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I'm not a real emotional guy. You know, I just uh, I enjoy racing. I love the race. Uh, my dad brought me up that way. Uh, you know, that's what I am. I'm a racer. Congratulations, Robbie. Thanks a lot. Not a bad way to walk off, Doc. Robbie Reiser saying farewell. What an effort, uh, Matt Kenseth. He blew a tire with that burnout. And he finishes the year as a winner at Homestead Miami Speedway. Jamie Little. Oh, it's a Gatorade bath down here. Matt Kenseth, the end of an era today with this traditional car, this win. You go out with this win and the last win with your crew chief. What does this win mean to you, Matt? It means we're getting wet right now. But, uh, uh, it's a great feeling. I just uh, feel like I really let these guys down. We uh, lost a lot of close races this year. So um feels great to win, a, win one, win a close one. Congratulations to Jimmy and Rick Hendrick and them guys. And uh, I think to Wildcar, USG, uh, Renai, RNL Trucking, RNL Carriers, and uh, all our sponsors that make this happen. This is an awesome ride today. Talk about that last restart. You came over the radio and scared your entire team thinking something was wrong with the car. I used to pull that one on Robbie all the time. You know, they say I got a big imagination, but I really did think it. You know, whenever you're leading, you always think that. But uh, I must have got a big piece of uh, uh, debris on the right front tire to start shaking a little bit. And as soon as I got to one, it, it rubbed off. So uh, it was a, 
pretty dominating day. It was pretty fun. How about you and Robbie's ride? From the beginning, he's the only crew chief you've ever known. What are you going to miss about working with him? Well, it's cool going as a win, you know, and I'm going to miss working with him on Sundays, but, you know, he's not going far. You know, he's going to manage the shop, and I really think that uh, his presence is really going to be a big plus for everybody at Roush Fenway Racing. I think it'll make everybody stronger, and, uh, you know, I'll miss him doing it, but, yeah, I'm looking forward to the challenge and uh, looking forward to making the company stronger. You going to take this car home now? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I blew the quarter panel off, so at least we don't have to race it again. <laughs> They're not ever going to race it again. Congratulations. Second win for Matt Kenseth. Doc? Jamie, it came down to two drivers and one race and one championship. Jeff Gordon drove as hard as he could drive today. He will finish fourth in this race, second in the championship points. And there's the guy who becomes the champion again in 2007. Jimmy Johnson, two in a row in championship. We'll come back to capture the stories and the emotion in just a moment. Back at Homestead Miami Speedway, let the celebration begin for Jimmy Johnson and the Hendrick Motorsports team there, the Lowe's team, Chad Knauson Company, as they have won back-to-back -back Cup Series championships. Let's go down where Dave Burns is caught up with Jeff Gordon. Tonight's fourth place finisher, but uh, wishing it could have been so much so much more for you, Jeff. How um, how difficult was it to try and make up all the ground you could tonight? Well, we knew it wasn't about tonight. I mean, had, had we performed the last four weeks like we did tonight uh, might be a different outcome. You know, when those guys stepped up and got themselves in a position to win races, we uh, we, we, we just didn't have the car, didn't didn't have the, you know, the, the whole uh, combination together at the right timing. And, and uh, unfortunately, we got behind and uh, came in here with an 86-point deficit. And, you know, it's hard to close up on, on, on Jimmy and those guys. Uh, you know, they did a great job. I, you know, it's a bittersweet thing for me because we had one of the most awesome years that uh, we've ever had. I mean, the top fives the top tens I mean what more can you can you do than what we did and and yet we got beat and um, you know I'm very proud and, and excited for Jimmy and Chad all the guys in that low Chevrolet and Rick Hendrick uh, to bring home another championship to be one two in the points I mean it's an awesome year um, but you know what we wanted to be the champions and uh, we got beat so it's gonna make us hungry over the offseason I can tell you that but I could be more proud of Steve Latard all the guys in our DuPont Chevrolet the effort they put in all year long and I got to thank the fans man they've been so supportive you know to, to go for that that fifth championship this year to have all my fans all over the country you know just pushing us saying you can do it you can get it done meant the world to me i hate we didn't get it done for them let's go get them next year jeff if you could i want you to play out just a little bit the commentary on the competitiveness in this chase this finish will give you an average finish of under five for the chase and yet the 48 team with the same cars under the same roof and a lot of friendship and uh, and notes shared, frankly, between you two went out and beat you. Is that does that make it tough? It does. You know, you know what? Uh, I mean, they've got basically the same car, same equipment. We do a little bit of things different because Jim, Jimmy drives a little bit different. But um, you know what? I feel like we probably should have got a little more aggress aggressive sooner. Our our thing all year long was that we were consistently in the top five. You know, and and we'd sneak those wins in there when we could. Jimmy and Chad and those guys are a little more aggressive. They're a little bit faster at times. But you know it seemed like some some things you know uh, got they got caught up in some things when they did that we were kind of banking that maybe that would be the case if we put those average finishes together so looking back on it you know we should have got more aggressive tonight was one of the more aggressive setups that we've had in this car in a long time and it was one of the best cars we've had in a while so you know what you can always do it better and we'll, we'll, we'll go back and look at everything that we can do for the future whole new ball game next year with the, uh, the Impala the car tomorrow and um, you know I'm looking forward to some off time spent some time with Ingrid and Ella and the family and Thanksgiving with my family and um, then we're going to go to work in January and get after it. Congratulations on a great season Jeff that's the four time champion Doc and he set a modern era record with 30 top 10 finishes what an effort for Jeff Gordon and how about this guy Jimmy Johnson back to back I mean unbelievable season for Jimmy Johnson and the flag is in the cars he does the donuts and the celebrations and uh he did what he had to do, four consecutive wins in a row coming into here with an 86-point lead, and he will win this title by 77 points, by the way, the largest margin in the four-year history of the chase. You know, he can finally breathe now. He told me this morning, man, Rusty, I just want to breathe. I'm so tense, and now he can do it. So much pressure, but so much joy now. 
Sammy pulls up in front of the championship stage, and uh, finally his wife comes over to give him a big hug. And let's go down to Alan Beswick in the championship ceremony. Here he comes, the champion. champion again last year when you got out of the car yeah set that down it's probably a little heavy after a 400 mile race last year when you got out of the car you said i'm not even sure i know what to say you've been through that experience once you're the champion your thoughts um you know last year was just an amazing season and such an honor to be the next cup champion and to come back this year and, and uh, not lose anything over the off season for my guys to work as hard as they have to give me this opportunity to win the championship again i can't thank them enough i'm just so proud of this race team i mean we we work very hard to, to be where we are and i can't thank these guys enough for their hard work and dedication uh, i can't thank nascar enough nextel and uh, first and foremost lowe's and all their employee owners for everything they do for us um, this just uh, it's such a special time for me i can't believe uh, Everything, all the success that I've been able to experience, I've been so blessed, and um, it's just awesome stuff. <laughs> I see that smile just wanted to break out really big. The race tonight, you were up front for a while, then you got mired back in traffic a little bit. Was this a nerve-wracking race, or did you have more than you were using? Um, there's probably a little bit more, but I don't think I had anything to win the race tonight. Uh, there's a couple times where we took four tires, where some guys took two. Uh, we got trapped down a lap, which wasn't any fun, but we were able to get a quick caution right away and get back going again. So, um, you know, just uh, a, a long night, but I have to say, after what I experienced last year coming into this season and even this this night, uh, just went so much smoother for me. Um, I was in the right right frame of mind, could focus on the right things. Uh, had the great support from these crew guys, great support from my loving wife, and uh, everything came together we're rocking four wins in this championship in the last five races how did this team get on such a roll we're not really sure but we're not we don't really care either <laughs> we're just happy it happened um, it's just been a, an unbelievable role these races are always good for us at the end uh, we stayed focused on the right things and got the job done and you know, I can't go without also thanking Jeff Gordon for his um, you know the time that he spent researching me looking into me as a driver uh, being a great friend and a great teammate and I think everybody saw the, the relationship play out through the chase he's just an awesome guy I had to thank Rick Hendrick um, as well for believing in me and even Ricky Hendrick he's not here with us any longer but I know he did a lot behind the scenes for me with his dad I want to talk about racing your teammates people that work in the same building your guys do prepare the same cars that you do you guys talked all through you were asked a lot of questions about how difficult that was now tell us how difficult was it racing those guys you look at every day right next door you know, it was difficult, but we knew what we were up against, and we were up against the best in the business. And uh, to have a heads-up race like this against those guys, it's everything we dreamt of having, having in that 2448 shop. And uh, we got it. We finished one, two in points. I know Mr. Hendrick smiling ear to ear. And, uh, you know, we did all that we could as, a, as the 2448 shop could. It just was, you know, the 48th year this year, and uh, hopefully we come back next year and can do it again. Back-to-back -back championships. It's okay if you want to scream. Uh, it's crazy. <laughs> I don't even know what to think. Uh, it's crazy. And this man right here is uh, the reason why. Here's the team owner, Rick Hendrick, his wife, Linda, behind him as well. Mr. Hendrick, you know we're not going to let you get away with, without a question. Your seventh championship at this division, which is something incredible. Your thoughts? Well, you know. You always hope that you can win one of these things, and uh, I'm so proud of these guys. They've worked hard, and what an unbelievable year he's had. And, and Jeff, uh, I'm just so proud of Jimmy and his team. And, you know, to get get back-to-back, -back, it's hard to do in a sport. So we're, uh, we're excited, and hopefully we can carry this momentum into next year. How difficult was this for you to have two of your drivers going head-to-head -head for this title? It is, this is really tough. I mean, you know, they work so hard. They work together. We share information. And you wouldn't, you, you think you it's going to happen. It could happen. That's what you want to see it come down like this to the two cars. But, uh, man, it, it, is, it is tough because it's like, like having a state championship in baseball. And you got one kid pitching and one batting, and somebody's got to lose. And it's such a tough deal. You came very close to getting very wet there, but they missed you. My last question for you would be, 
What does the owner get out of winning? What does the owner get out of a championship? You're not behind the wheel. You're the man pulling all the strings in, in the business sense of the things, but what, what's the payoff for you? Well, you know, when you see guys like Chad Knauss that started just, you know, doing body work on the 2014, to come up through the ranks and become a crew chief. I remember Jimmy when he was 16 years old and we ran a late model car and then to watch him become a champion, just to be a part of it, to, to see Jeff Gordon when he started, Kyle, Casey, and all the guys that helped along the way, to just see Stevie and those guys just blossom and become one of the best in the sport. And you think back to the day when they were just working in the shop cleaning up and uh, makes you awful proud. So I'm just part, I'm just really excited about being a, being a part of it and they deserve it. They worked hard a lot of years and uh, it, this is the kind of the fruits of all that labor. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Hendrick. Congratulations, Jimmy. Chad, we talked to you just a minute ago. Congratulations. There's going to be a big check and a trophy presented to these guys formally in just a little while, Doc. Alan, the last time two teammates finished 1-2 in the championship, they were also Hendrick cars. 1996, when Terry Labonte beat Jeff Gordon for the championship. And again, the Hendrick teams do it 1-2. What an effort for Rick Hendrick. You can see it's all about family. You saw Casey Mears in hugging there. Jeff... All the guys up there just celebrating a championship back-to-back -back wins. There is the NASCAR next L Cup that goes to Jimmy Johnson and the Lowe's team for the second year in a row. What a performance here down the stretch in the chase for the next L Cup. Back with more from Homestead, Miami after these messages and a word from our ABC stations. Coming up, the biggest music stars on the planet come together with live performances by Rascal Flatts, Maroon 5, Lenny Kravitz, Fergie, Rihanna, and more. For the first time ever, your votes will decide who wins. Hosted by Jimmy Kimmel and broadcast live from the Nokia Theater, L.A. It's the American Music Awards live tonight coming up following our coverage here at Homestead, Miami on ABC. Championship celebration ongoing, and here is winner's circle, victory lane, Matt Kenseth. But what a performance down the stretch for Kenseth. Five consecutive top five finishes, including the win here. And Kenseth moves from 12th in the chase, early in the chase, all the way up to finish in the fourth position. He gains a couple of spots. How about the big gain by the two car for Kurt Busch, the only dodge in the chase. Up three positions, he finishes seventh overall in the points. Mike Massaro. And Kurt Busch ends his 2007 campaign with a solid second place effort. How would you assess your night? It was a good night. Uh, we had uh, a bad pit stop and a loose wheel, and we had to fight back from that. Uh, but luckily, we caught a nice break that uh, jumped us up into the top 10, and we ran hard, uh, and we ran strong. It feels good that we were able to do that at this point in the season, to jump up a few spots and points. That's a feather in the cap for this crew and this team. So Miller Lite, uh, they're happy about us making the chase. We want to do a little better, and we did great for Dodge this year, and I'm real happy that we got what we did out of tonight and this season. So I'd call it a success with the two teams. Lewis Wheel, obviously, uh, a bit of a setback, but you guys did a tremendous job keeping up with this racetrack. How difficult of a challenge was that tonight? Yeah, we had been losing track of the track, um, you know, midway through the race, getting real loose and just trying to make big adjustments. And when you're trying to tighten up a car, it just makes it a little slow to start. And at least we made Kenseth earn his win today. That was great to race with him. And, you know, we just got beat all year by the Hendrick cars, uh, time in and time out. So they deserve to finish up where they did. With the season now in your rearview mirror, give me some perspective on how you thought 2007 went. This was a great season for me to fit in with Penske and this team uh, to be able to bring Miller to the chase and to be the only Dodge in the chase. We, we felt like that was uh, a big success. And so we'll look back on this year as a good transitional year and, and hopefully this will propel us into some success in 2008. Uh, we're, we're excited. We can't get ready to go. You've been here before. You've hoisted the championship trophy and celebrated here in Homestead. When you look at what Hendrick Motorsports accomplished this year, the 48 and 24 in particular, what were your thoughts on the way this championship played out with those two guys? I felt like they had an advantage with the COT. Uh, the team that jumped on it right away was going to be tough to beat, and they had that. And so that's what our team has to do better is uh, figure out the COT and, and work at finishing consistent. Uh, both Jimmy and Jeff posted some top tens that were phenomenal. I think they only finished out of the top ten a handful of times. It's tough to beat that type of dominance. So uh, reminded me of Gordon's season back in 1998 when he dominated, and then to see Jimmy uh, win all these races here at the end. Uh, he's the outright champion back to 
to back. Congratulations to those guys. And Mr. Hendrick, he's got it going on, and maybe Dale Earnhardt Jr. now, he's got that team. He can put it together. Congratulations on another very solid season. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. Kurt Busch bringing it home second here at Homestead. Yeah, very nice job for Kurt Busch finishing second uh, in the race, finishing seventh in the point standings. When we return, we'll go back to the championship stage for some very special presentations. Jimmy Johnson and the Lowe's team back-to-back -back NASCAR next Dell Cup champion. Big hug from the family there. Jimmy Johnson giving his dad his family a big hug, and it's all about family here and how much of the support he had growing up as a youngster in El Cajon, California. 32 years of age this year, but the dream began many, many years ago. And in 2007, a series leading 10 wins, four consecutive wins down the stretch in the chase. And for the second consecutive year, he becomes the champion in just his sixth full season. Let's go back down to the championship stage and Alan Bestwick. Dr. Punch, thank you. Gathered around with the Hendrick Motorsports team, Jimmy Johnson, Rick Hendrick, Chad Knauss, and their cast of hundreds. And time now for the formal presentation of the next L Cup Championship Trophy. I introduce the chairman and chief executive officer of NASCAR, Mr. Brian France. Thank you, Alan. On behalf of the best fans in sports, not only here in South Florida, but all over the country, are NASCAR fans, and they witnessed a dominant performance, maybe as dominant as we've seen in the modern era. Jimmy is a great champion now. He'll remain a great champion for OH. Jimmy, we're real proud of you. Let me get this trophy to you right now. just for a second, Jimmy, because we're on a short microphone cord, and introduce Tim Kelly, the chief marketing officer from Sprint Nextel, who has a, a rather large check for you. I do. Uh, Jimmy, congratulations, congratulations to Rick Hendrick and the Lowe's team, back-to-back -back championships. Absolutely amazing. Everyone at Sprint Nextel is so happy to have you as the uh, champion of our series, and I'd like to present you with a check for $6.7 million. <laughs> because there's someone else here that's going to get a rather large check because Jimmy Johnson won this championship. We have more money to give away, Jimmy, and you'll be happy to know that Terry Randall of Las Vegas, Nevada, selected you as her driver in the Sprint Speed Millions contest. And today, Terry's with us, and she's receiving a check for $1 million. Come on out here, Terry. Let me step back here. Jimmy Johnson is the NASCAR Next L Cup Series champion for 2007. Congratulations to the whole Hendrick Motorsports team here on the stage. Doc? Thank you very much, Alan Beswick, and congratulations to Teresa Randall, the uh, Sprint Million winner from Las Vegas, Nevada. What a great place to go back to with a million extra bucks in your pocket. How about Jimmy Johnson? $6,740,800 on top of all he's already won here thus far. Back in a moment. ESPN's coverage of NASCAR Nextel Cup Series Ford 400 on ABC. Brought to you by the new 2008 Focus. Zales, the perfect gift at Zales, the diamond store. And Shell, made to move. Championship celebration continuing Homestead Miami Speedway and uh, Jimmy Johnson and this crew have done it and as they raise the flag 
as Jimmy Johnson, the official 2007 NASCAR Nextel Cup champion, two years in a row. How about we go down and visit with a very proud Papa, Alan Bestwick. Well, up here in the middle of the crowd on the stage is Jimmy Johnson's father, Gary. What's this like for a dad? I, I know I watch my sons do things that make me so proud. What's this like for you? Well, it, it's just amazing because watching it on TV, all, you know, when Jimmy's a little kid and and uh, watching like Dale Jarrett and his dad announcing at the Daytona win with Ed crying, I was crying. And now, you know, to be here and, and winning two champions, Jimmy winning two championships, just, I don't, I'm still pinching myself. When he got started racing, you were the one fixing the motorbikes and that kind of thing, helping him develop his love of motorsports. Did you ever think that love would be something the two of you would share for this long in your lives? Yeah, no, it, it's amazing. And uh, I'm still pinching myself, like I said, because it just keeps going and going, and uh, he keeps getting better and better. And through motorcycles, jet skis, everything, we raced everything. And for him, the career path he took to get here was very odd, you know, because we raced everything. But we all did it as a family, and there's a lot of love, and uh, just had a great time doing it. Where did you watch the race from, and how nerve-wracking was it? Well, I got Grandma with me here, so <laughs> we uh, we watched it in the coach in the infield, and then we come back out here. It wasn't as nerve-wracking as last year. <laughs> Not quite as bad. <laughs> congratulations to you. I hope you enjoy the uh, the championship and the success your son has had. Thank you very much. Grandma, congratulations to you, too. Thank you. We planned it this way. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, grandma's always no best. Uh, proud uh, Gary Johnson, Jimmy's dad down there celebrating as with all the team. And a little bit ago, we saw uh, Jimmy's teammate, Casey Mears, up there to congratulate everyone. And how about Jeff Gordon coming out to celebrate with uh, with a guy he chased all year long, his protege. And he, Jimmy talked about how this team would not be where it was if it wasn't for Jeff Gordon's unselfishness when the team started up and how much input he has given this team to help them get up and running. Remember, it was in Jeff Gordon's sixth year, and as a driver, he won back-to-back -back titles. And this year, in Jimmy Johnson's sixth year, he indeed has won back-to-back -back titles. And uh, Jeff Gordon going to come out and celebrate with Jimmy Johnson and the crew with what a great championship season they have had. All the way back out from the garage area. You see him headed back up there toward the stage. I'm sure he wants to go out and be able to give Rick Hendrick and, and Jimmy. I mean, this is a team that shared so much throughout the year on and off the racetrack. Yesterday in the garage area, Jimmy Johnson was talking about, I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for Jeff Gordon. Jeff really believed in him. Put his heart and soul into him. They share everything. They've taught each other a whole lot. Jeff's been a big part of this championship with Jimmy Johnson. Jeff congratulating Chad Canals, and you can see the sincerity and the big smile. And when you got a four-time cup champion coming up to say, yeah, you guys did a great job, that's got to make you awfully proud. Well, it just so it goes to show you how much of a team they are. Andy, it's just a great feeling for Chad Canals and everybody. This is great for Chad winning back-to-back. -back. I know the sense of pride he's got for this race team. Let's go down to Alan Bestwick. You know, Doc, there was a point earlier this season where Chad Knauss was not able to come to the racetrack. He was under suspension from NASCAR, and Ron Malik filled in as the crew chief. He had a big hand in this championship. He's been with Jimmy Johnson through his entire oval track racing career. What's this like for you to be part of your best friend winning two straight championships? I mean, this is one of the biggest accomplishments in both of our lives, and I mean, I just hope it just keeps going on strong. I'm going to stick with Jimmy. You know, he hasn't done me wrong in my career yet, and he's a great person to work for. And Obviously a pretty damn good driver. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What's the one thing about Jimmy that a best friend would know that most people probably wouldn't know? Uh, he's just really a genuine person. You know, he's his heart is in the team and in his racing, you know, and it, it's always been that way, and I think it'll always stay that way. The, the races where you served as crew chief leading this team when Chad was absent, did you feel pressure? Was it uh, not that big a deal because you've been with this team? How were those six races in hindsight? Uh, there was some pressure there, you know, because it felt like I was, you know, the one with all the weight on my shoulders making the decisions. And it is a big responsibility, and I give a lot of, you know, respect for Chad for what he does every week, and especially in a situation like tonight, it's, it's a lot of pressure there. You're one of the guys that goes over the wall and services the car on pit stops, as well as one of the mainstays as far as leading the team. A championship to you. We see the driver, the big check comes out, the trophy. What's it mean to you to be a NASCAR Nextel Cup champion? Oh, it's huge. You know, our whole team, our whole organization at Hendrick Motorsports, I mean, we all work together as one. And, I mean, for us to win two championships in a row in this sport is pretty incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. That's Ron Malik. He was the uh, crew chief when Chad Knauss was absent. He's one of Jimmy's best friends. And he as well is a back-to-back -back Nextel Cup champion, Doc.
Indeed, and what shows you the depth and the strength of this Hendrick Motorsports team is now uh, Jeff Gordon up to be able to congratulate some of the people that are a part of the Hendrick organization that he has been a part of for so long. Now, we saw Casey Mears earlier run up to the stage and give Jimmy Johnson a big hug and congratulations, and now Mike Massaro has caught up with Jimmy Johnson's teammate. And Casey Mears brings it home 16th tonight. How would you assess the evening? <laughs> We had a long night, we did, but uh, you know, I'm so proud of what Jimmy and, and Chad and all those guys on the 48 Lowe's team have accomplished this year. Um, Hendrick Motorsports is just a great place to be. Uh, we got caught up a little bit this year and didn't get, uh, you know, didn't get exactly what we wanted and didn't have the run tonight for sure that we wanted for the National Guard and GMAC, but uh, again, I'm, I'm just so excited for what Jimmy and those guys have accomplished, it's unbelievable. As outsiders, we have a certain perspective of how this whole thing went, the whole dynamic between Jimmy and Jeff, but you're you're close to these guys. You're friends with them. What was it like for you watching them battle for this championship over the last month and a half? I mean, they're both very competitive guys, obviously driven. They want to win, and, and uh, you know, Fortunately, I, I guess uh, for Jimmy, things went his it went his direction, and they were just unstoppable, really. I mean, the, the races that they had at the end of the year and, and the races that he won, um, I think tonight, you know, he was being conservative, and, and to run where they were to run conservatively is, is unbelievable. So, I mean, it was definitely his year. Um, Jeff put on such a good run, you know, towards the middle of the season leading up to the chase, and in the chase, had an unbelievable run. I mean, if it would have been any other year, Jeff probably would have won the championship, just Jimmy had that much of a better year. So, I mean, the 24 team didn't do anything wrong. It's just the 48 team that just a little bit better and and uh, it was their year I'm sure Jeff uh, is definitely gonna want to come back and get one again and of course being a teammate you've got to be able to take some of these fringe benefits how how does the level of competition that they've achieved uh, affect the rest of the teams in the Hendrick camp well, I think that uh, obviously the success is there. You know, the equipment's there, the people are there. It's all the right, all the right stuff. Um, obviously, we struggled this year with kind of a new deal and and, and getting up and running. But uh, what I'm so excited about is is obviously the performance they put in this year. We're going to be able to assess what they've done, uh, really kind of dig our heels in for next season and be ready to go. Congratulations on a great season. All right, thank you. Casey Mears finishes 16th tonight. And moves up to 15th in the final point standings. Championship celebration ongoing. Jimmy Johnson over $15.8 million in earnings in 2007. Back with more in a moment. Coming up next, the American Music Awards, live from the Nokia Theater LA. Live performances by Rascal Flatts, Maroon 5, Lenny Kravitz, Fergie, Rihanna, and much more. And guys, former champions in your own right, how would you put into perspective the kind of performance we saw this year for Jimmy Johnson and his whole team? Jim, er, Doc, I've never seen domination like this in a long, long time. Johnson, this guy is for real. He's here to stay, and he's going to be proud because this man's amazing. And it moves Chad Canals up a notch in my book. He's a great crew chief, and what a great night for Robbie Riser, his last race with Matt Kenseth. And Brent Musburger, this may go down as one of the all-time most dominant performances in Nextel Cup history. Jimmy Johnson back-to-back -back championships. Yeah, exactly, Dr. Jerry Punch. You know, the NASCAR season, ladies and gentlemen, is a marathon. And I want to congratulate all the announcers and a wonderful group of technicians here at ESPN who for that 36th period of time have brought you this amazing coverage. And I want to also remind you that coming up next on ABC, except on the West Coast, the American Music Awards over most of these ABC stations. Well, congratulations to our race winner here today, Matt Kenseth. He led for more than 200 miles this afternoon. He was dominant coming down the stretch, and what a way to finish. And then, of course, our Nextel Cup champion, back-to-back -back champions, if you will, because he came home with the flag again. Jimmy Johnson with Chad Knauss and that wonderful group of people up there in the pits. And, folks, what a year it's been. Come on, come on, come on. 
negotiations and intense effort, we decide that it's time for us to move on. My new boss, 2008, Mr. Rick Hendrick. Casey Mears is going to win his first next Cup race. Juan Pablo Montoya wins at Sonoma. Martin Truex wins. The Autism Speaks 400. We got some sad news. Bill France Jr. has passed away. We remember the man who made NASCAR what it is today. I'm going to find you again. Just I just don't know what we're going to do now that we don't have him. Love can die. But I know what he wants us to do. Exactly what we're doing here today. Coming to the checkers. Oh, oh, oh. Jamie McMurray has won the Pepsi 400. for the 2007 NASCAR chase of the next Dell Cup. Race number one in the chase, and Cliff Boyer becomes the fourth first-time winner. Jimmy Johnson wins his third Las Vegas victory, two in a row. They touch once, twice, drag race. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, Johnson. their fourth win of the season, his fifth win of the year. Number six in 2007. You never seen to me, my brother. In victory lane for the second time this season here at the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Ninth win of the year. Four 